start all of this over again. Um, my name is Jimmy Van Bramer, and I am proud to be the chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. We are convening today with Councilmember King, who's chair of the Select Committee on Libraries, to discuss uh, oversight of the uh, capital project and program for our public libraries uh, with a specific focus on the Department of Design and Construction and how well these projects are being completed and monitored and overseen. As I was uh, saying previously, we have dramatically increased funding for our public libraries in terms of their capital program. I'm really proud to have worked with the mayor and the administration on that with this city council. Uh, but with that infusion of hundreds of millions of dollars comes our solemn obligation to make sure that we are spending those dollars appropriately, uh, that there is appropriate uh, oversight. And we have seen uh, too many examples. And obviously, the situation in my district uh, at the Hunters Point Library is one such case where uh, I believe we can say that uh, the people of Long Island City and Western Queens have been deprived of having their library open in a timely fashion. Uh, but also with delays goes uh, cost overruns. And uh, we have to make sure that taxpayer dollars are being spent wisely, uh, that good decisions are being made by the agency, uh, and that those projects are being overseen. And when there are significant problems, that direct and immediate uh, and concrete action is taken to make sure that we can get those projects uh, back on track. Needless to say, we have a lot of concerns. I know that I have a lot of concerns. I believe some of my colleagues have some concerns about this issue. And so we will talk to DDC uh, and the three library systems about uh, how we can do this work better, uh, how we can make sure that people are getting uh, what they need from the city of New York. And when a library is delayed a year or two years, or several years, uh, we know that uh, they are not getting what they deserve. Uh, the people are not uh, being treated appropriately. Uh, and we have an obligation to ask the tough questions and get the answers to make sure that these things are happening the way they should. We are again are talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, if not when you consider the entire uh, future 10-year uh, build out uh, in amounts in the billions uh, uh, just for our libraries, which is a great investment. It is a wise investment. We should be investing hundreds of millions of dollars in our public libraries. But if people lose faith in the Department of Design and Construction's ability to implement these contracts, if people lose faith in the ability of the City of New York to spend the money wisely and open buildings when they were told they would be open, then we actually threaten and erode support for our public libraries. That is an unacceptable outcome for me, obviously, as someone who's dedicated the last 20 years of my life to our public libraries. And as someone who has invested uh, literally tens of millions of dollars in the Hunters Point Library uh, and who has been very involved for 20 years in the building of a $40 million library, uh, we have seen, uh, I believe, uh, horrific decisions made uh, that have compounded uh, these dreadful decisions of the past that have led to a situation where today we still have a library with a gaping hole in it. Uh, we still have a library that has not been closed, uh, even though all the glass has now arrived, I believe, from Europe. Um, but even just saying that, that the glass has arrived from Europe, uh, I believe is part of the problem. And obviously, we'll be asking many different uh, discussions about that. Clearly, there's a task force. Uh, the Center for an Urban Future has issued reports. Uh, there is a great deal of focus on this issue. Uh, and I know that there have been some changes made to DDC. And I know that the acting commissioner is here and will talk about all of this. 
but uh, clearly this is an area of great concern for me, for the council, for the city of New York, and the people of Long Island City. I'll ask my colleague, Councilmember King, uh, to say a few words from the Select Committee on Libraries, then we'll swear you in, we'll have your testimony, questions, and then hear from the three library systems as well. Councilmember King. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and happy Hanukkah to all. Um, first, I want to thank you, Councilmember uh, Van Bramer, Chair Van Bramer, for all the work that you've done decades to making sure our library system stays strong and vibrant, not only in the borough of Queens, but throughout the city of New York. For those of you, I'm Councilmember Andy King, and I'm looking forward to hearing today's testimony from uh, the library systems and the construct on the construction projects. New York City is serves, uh, served by three independent systems, library systems, with 216 local library branches that offer free and open access to 377 electronic databases as more as 65 million books, periodicals, as well as other circulating and reference items. Local branches also offer career services and internet access, as well as educational, culture, and recreational programming for New Yorkers of all ages, from toddlers to seniors. Libraries are multi-purpose for our communities and information centers. They serve as safe havens for our children after school and a place where immigrants and other non-native speakers of the English language can learn English and where people can go to obtain free tax assistance and business services, also including and that is technical assistance for small businesses. It is therefore vital that we, have, that we support our libraries and that we support the expansion of library programming services that they, that they offer. However, when it comes to capital projects in the library, capital construction project, it seems that the city is falling short, short, and really short. Projects including fairly routine projects are delayed for years driving up costs. Public libraries are fundament fundamentally public good for in our democracy, and it is a shame that New Yorkers must bear the brunt of a delayed project. Therefore, I'm looking forward to hearing from the Department of Design and Construction and the city's three library systems on how these projects can be improved so we may better serve all New Yorkers. Again, I want to thank you, Chair Van Bramer. I want to thank you for being such a tireless advocate, as well as all those who work in the library systems, the subcommittees on libraries, and everyone who reads a book, buys a book, and shares information. Again, happy holidays to all. Thank you very much, uh, Chair King. Now we are going to hear uh, from Anna Barrio, Justin Walter, and Thomas Foley. I believe I got the names correct. Uh, we'll swear the three of you in, and then you'll begin your testimony. Will you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Van Bremer, Library Subcommittee Chair King, and members of the Cultural Affairs and Library Committee. I'm Anna Barrio, Acting Commissioner of the New York City Department of Design and Construction. I'm joined here today, as you mentioned, Chair, uh, to my right, Tom Foley, who's the Deputy Commissioner of Public Buildings for DDC, and to my left is, is Justin Walter, Chief Administrative Officer. Thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today about this important topic. While we value every project at DDC, we understand how important libraries are and the vital services and resources that they provide to the communities. In size, organization, and scope, New York City's three systems are unique among municipal libraries in terms of circulation, research, and collections. Libraries are at the heart of our neighborhoods. Well-designed libraries provide welcoming space for all New Yorkers where they can access services and knowledge in all its forms for the 21st century. Libraries today can become catalytic projects, improving community cohesion, helping youth with job and education assistance, and providing a first introduction to books and socialization for our youngest. They are beacons for our neighborhoods and provide safe spaces for all to learn. We at DDC are proud to work side by side with our colleagues at our city's three library systems in designing and constructing these facilities. Over the past six months since I've been acting commissioner, we have collaborated more than ever with the library system and their staff and leadership to enhance these relationships. Around the city, the three library systems are continuing to renovate, expand, and build new branches. Whether it is through directly managing the design and construction or working closely with the library institution 
through a contracting device often referred to as a pass-through. BDC looks forward to continuing to assist in the growth and improvement of the systems. As the city's primary capital construction delivery agency, the funding for our projects is provided by the 28 city agencies that we collaborate with. DDC is currently managing 905 active projects, 438 projects in public buildings, and 467 in infrastructure, with a value of $12.56 million, billion, I'm sorry, billion dollars, and that is roughly half for public buildings and half for infrastructure. Our work for the three library systems, Queensborough Public Library, New York Public Library, and Brooklyn Public Library, includes 137 active projects valued at approximately $410 million. Libraries account for 15% of all DDC active projects and about 30% of all DDC public buildings work. In the past five years, DDC has completed 114 library projects, 28 for QPL, 59 for NYPL, and 27 for BPL. These recently completed projects include four new branches, Elmhurst and Glen Oaks in Queens, Kensington in Brooklyn, and Mariners Harbor in Staten Island. Just to give you a background of our organization, the DDC Libraries Unit is currently comprised of 49 staff. It is headed by an executive director who reports to an assistant commissioner, and ultimately assistant commissioner reports to uh, Deputy Commissioner Foley. Each borough unit is led by a director, a deputy director for design, a deputy program director for construction, and various program managers. As you know, the City Council, Finance Committee, this administration, and the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, Cultural Affairs, Parks, and DDC have been discussing capital projects and how to improve the delivery of the projects. During these discussions, it has been impressed upon everyone that construction is indeed unique. Every project is different due to a variety of factors, including the actual scope of work, the location of the project, and the amount of funding available for the capital need of the project. Moreover, there are differences attributable to whether the project is brand new construction versus a construction project that will renovate or rehabilitate an existing building or space. In general, construction is performed in an uncontrolled environment. We work very closely with each library system to tackle the issues that arise, and our goal is to deliver the best product to our clients on time and on budget. However, common challenges in library and other cultural projects include funding that originates from a variety of sources, the age and maintenance history of the buildings where libraries are located, changes made to the scope of projects after they have begun, market forces driving up bid process, prices, and performance issues with low bid contractors. DDC must follow New York State General Municipal Law Section 103, also known as GML 103, which mandates that construction contracts be awarded to the lowest bidder that is responsive to the bid documents and the ability to demonstrate the integrity to receive a public works project. In addition, DDC follows Chapter 13 of City Charter and the rules of the Procurement Policy Board under supervision of the various oversight agencies, such as the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, Department of Investigation, Small Business Services Division of Labor Services, and of course, OMB. Uh, Chairperson Van Bremer, I would like to directly address the Hunters Point Library Project that you have personally been involved with since its inception. Since I stepped into the role of acting commissioner, my team and I have had a number of conversations with you about this project, as well as a site visit, um, and as well as some conversations with the leadership of Queens Public Library, who I believe will be testifying in a short while as well. As this neighborhood in Long Island City has grown, grown along with the entire expansion of the community, a decision was made many years ago to build an iconic library for the area. The Hunters Point branch was designed by a world-renowned architect, and when the final design was selected, it is my understanding that there were many, many communication and discussions with the various stakeholders. As one of the champions of the Hunters Point Library, I know you are frustrated by the progress of construction, 
Let me say that DDC shares your frustration, and I have also mentioned that to you. Nevertheless, we continue to push on all ends to complete the construction work, and we are taking lessons learned from this project and applying to other projects that are currently in design or in the early stages. One issue which you are very familiar with is the, is the sourcing of the window glass. I recall your passion about this issue at the last budget hearing in the spring. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, um, all the glass has arrived. It's already on site. Um, this glass was designated by the architect as critical to this design based on the lighting and efficiency needed for this building. It's all here and it's 80% installed. Um, the only portion that's not installed is the western side and we can talk uh, later on as to why that's not installed yet. We expect all the windows to be completed um, later uh, next month. And going forward, we have established a new policy in our design guidelines to ensure that there are several verified vendors to supply window glass for our projects. Moreover, the challenges that arose on the project are also part of the discussions with the uh, aforementioned uh, Capital Project Task Force. When building a facility, such as Hunters Point Library Branch, the city needs more contracting tools and reforms to the city's procurement process. The current limitation of awarding to the lowest bidder is an issue, and this is why this administration has been a great supporter of the design build legislation at the state level. Additionally, here are some of the lessons we're taking with us from the project, and these have been discussed on previous hearings related to DDC's budget, as well as with the task force. For example, working closely with the end user before a project is even a project at DDC. What does that mean? It means we need to address projects in the earliest stage, at the pre-project initiation phase of the process, and ensure that all the elements are in place for a project to proceed successfully before works begin. DDC, with the support of the council, the mayor's office and OMB, in, 19, in 2016 created the front end planning unit. Under our new process, once DDC receives the capital project initiation from a client agency, the front end planning unit reviews the project scope and budget in order to ensure that all critical elements of a project have been included in the scope of work and the project and the budget is adequate to fund it. They also conduct a site visit with the client agency to look for field conditions that may affect the project. In addition, they verify the available funding in the city's FMS financial management system and review history and filings for the site with the New York City Department of Buildings, the New York City Department of Finance, and the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission to avoid unforeseen challenges. Throughout this process, DDC maintains continuous communications with the client agency to keep them informed of progress. This entire front end planning process typically is completed within 30 to 60 days, but saves significant time, we believe, on the back end. The public building's front end planning unit currently has 12 staff lines, including a director, and they have fully assessed 86 CPIs, or new projects, in conjunction with site investigation, recommending that 41 proceed in the current form with non-recommendations for 45 projects or 52% of those reviewed. There are 26 assessments after site visits. There are also 26 assessments after site visits conducted that are still pending determination. Some of the common issues that front end planning has identified are projects with scope descriptions that were incomplete or did not define the area of work. Inadequate funding to cover the required scope of work, the lack of a restrictive covenant, and the failure to differentiate between capital versus maintenance work. When a project is not recommended to proceed, we never say that we return the project to the client. We always say it's not a recommendation at the moment. DDC will work with the client agency to address the problems so that the project can be reinitiated. Through the early analysis by front end planning, we seek to reduce the number of projects in which added scope and change orders could delay the process and increase overall costs. Front end planning should also help client agencies to better refine the funding requests they made to elected officials, reducing situations where council members provide funds 
they believe are adequate to find out later that DDC's estimate accounting for a full budget scope, project scope, and market conditions that affect bid prices is higher than the client agency's estimate. In addition, upon request from one of our client agencies, front end planning performs pre-CPI assessments, intervening yet earlier in the process than before. This provides our client agencies with information they need to create informed scopes of work, helps identify potential risks in the project, and provides a preliminary estimate of the required budget. To date, front end planning has reviewed 27 projects at the pre-CPI phase. Once a project passes through front end planning and a CPI is accepted by DDC, we have set up various internal steps to improve project delivery. Moving to the design phase, we have created an in-house design team, which has ramped up since its creation in, in 2016 to a total of 14 architects, engineers, and specification writers. By designing in-house, we now have the flexibility to work on certain projects without doing a procurement. And we have seen that our designs are um, prepared much faster than as opposed to our sourcing it. This is just another example of having more tools to better, better deliver on the various needs that arise during any year. The important library projects that DDC in-house design has tackled to date include library ADA compliance and roof upgrades and full interior redesigns. Working with the library systems, another change we have made during the design phase is to baseline the scope at the end of schematic design. This means the client signs off and accepts the project that will move forward to final design as is with the existing scope of work. We have also begun baselining the cost at the end of design development. These changes eliminate delays during design where scope is added and the designers must work to integrate the new elements, often having to start from the beginning and also this helps us to ensure that the available budget is sufficient when the project is put out to bid. We have also refocused our efforts with outside design consultants to emphasize the need to continue to design to budget, ensuring that the functionality of a building is equal to its architectural merit. We do understand that programmatic changes can occur and the design of a library may need to change, and we are open to those conversations. Overall, we are moving to a more structured environment with fewer open-ended issues and we are implementing changes at the beginning of the process to address the root causes of delays and budget overruns. One additional opportunity we worked with on with the Mayor's Office of Contractors, Mayor's Office of Contract Services and the Controls Office is the approval to treat library pass-through projects the same way we process the cultural grants program. This step is expected to reduce by at least six months the timeline to registration for each library system for the projects that they handle on their own, allowing them to proceed faster for this important work. We continue to work to meet the specific needs of each library system and find ways to ensure that project scopes and funding are aligned at the beginning of the projects. We have added greater transparency to the process with greater emphasis on managing expectation during the budgetary process. While challenges remain, we will continue to be creative to improve project delivery. This includes my remarks, and Chairperson, I am happy to answer any questions that you or your colleagues may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I know I have uh, lots of questions, and I know uh, Councilmember Constantinides uh, uh, has uh, a few questions as well. So I'll go back and forth. Um, so I allow my colleagues to uh, say a few words while I come back uh, probably a couple of times to the Hunter's Point uh, Library. But I wanted to ask in, uh, a few overarching questions, which is, um, how do you assess your on-time and on-budget uh, success and or failure as an agency? Do you, do you know what percentage of your projects are delivered on-time and on-budget? Yes, um, for the library systems, um, uh, for BPL is 68%, uh, NYPL is 70%, and for QPL is 81%. But I have to say that um, that's excluding any uh, client-initiated change order work. Could you just uh, uh, maybe speak a little bit more into the mic? Sure. Go over those three percentages and then that last piece that you said? You said go over the three percentages, cha Chairperson? 
Yes. Okay. 68% uh, for BPL, 70% for NYPL, 81% for QPL. This is the on-time performance for the library systems, and it excludes any change order initiated um, by the client. The client would be one of the library systems. So it excludes any change order right. from the client yes. agents. Uh, yes. Uh, what percentage of projects have any change orders from the client uh, agency? 54%. How many? 54%. Only 54% include any change order you're talking about on a project. Client-related change orders are 54%. Okay. Of the totals of the total change orders. And then you're saying minus that, for example, Queens Library is 81% on time and on budget capital projects. On time, excluding the change orders related to the client agencies. Yes, on time, just on time. That seems really high um, to me. And it also seems like um, you're throwing then much of the blame for failure to get it on time from agency-initiated change orders. Excuse me, can you repeat that, please? The, the percentages that you've got here mm -hmm. seem, based on my own experience, to be very high in terms of delivering library construction projects roughly 70% everywhere, and then 81% uh, in Queens. Mm -hmm. That seems very high to me, based on my own experience, anecdotally. But then you're saying that in 54, you're excluding 54% of the projects, uh, and those are because libraries have initiated change orders in those projects. Yes. So therefore, the systems themselves are responsible for many of the delays. Well, there could be a number. I, when there is scope added to the projects, um, and, and, and as I said earlier, and this is why we have a front-end planning um, unit now in place, we want to address those issues at the beginning as opposed to it being a possibly later on during construction or, or during design. Okay. Now, you, you were saying on time, but you didn't say on budget, right? Do you have a percentage for what projects are, are uh, on budget? I do not have that with me. I can share that with you. Afterwards? You don't have that with you? I do not. Okay, but you know that number? I will certainly look into it and share that with you, yes. That would seem like an important number to, to have. Yes. Um, so let me say this. So in terms of change orders and, and process, because you mentioned this in your testimony, mm -hmm. each library system uh, provides an estimate at the beginning of a project or at various points of a project. And, and then there are often change orders in any capital project, I'm guessing, right? Uh, both mm -hmm. that come from all sides, right, Certainly. in terms of change orders. But in terms of the original estimate, what role does DDC play in making sure that that estimate is accurate? And because it seems to me that, you know, the library systems, and obviously they all have capital uh, divisions and folks who are in charge of capital, but you all are the city agency, you all are, are uh, experts at this. Mm -hmm. If a library system says, okay, we have a building project, we're going to estimate that at $20 million, but then at the end of the day it winds up being more because of change orders and other things. But isn't it the obligation of the Department of Design and Construction at the very beginning of the process to make sure that those estimates are valid and accurate and that's where your level of expertise comes in. That is correct. And do you do that well? That is right now what, exactly what the front end planning uh, unit is responsible for, um, taking those initial uh, draft CPIs and discussing it with the library systems to see if the budget is aligned to the scope. Right, but it seems to it me- It was not done before, Chairperson. It, it was not done before. This is something fairly new that we're taking on over the last, a little over a year ago. So, so you weren't doing that before a year ago, now you're doing that? Yeah, correct. So before a year ago, when a library came to you with a project and an estimate, mm -hmm. um, what was your level of involvement in that? Or, you know, were you, did you have any input? Did you weigh in? Did you say, you know what, I think your idea for a 22,000 square foot library mm -hmm. is low? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then 
that's at the very beginning, sort of the aspirational right. phase. Right. But then when there's actually uh, a plan, when there's mm -hmm. an architect chosen, and when you actually start to map these things out, it would seem to me like another opportunity for DDC to weigh in and say, this is actually not right. That is correct. So um, previously, uh, the CPI, um, as I said, with the front end planning unit, uh, what is sent to us is a draft CPI. Pre front end planning unit, the CPI was sent to us. Um, we did not have input as to the budget, and uh, the CPI was accepted as is from the client agency. So it seems to me like there has been a lack of oversight, right? There has been a lack of input um, when it comes to these projects um, from your agency. Would you agree with that? Yes, yes, and this is why we have, um, working obviously with the support of the council and support of OMB, we have made these improvements to institute these initiatives and these units to really have a better oversight over the projects. And would you also agree that your agency plays the role of working with the library systems mm -hmm. Uh, to make sure that they're getting the expertise and the assistance that they need to make these projects happen in a timely and expeditious manner. Yes. And would you agree that the agency has fallen short of that? Uh, before the front-end planning unit was formed, I would say that we could have done better. A lot better. Would you agree with that? Yes. Because I want to go back to your, your, your numbers, which again, I'd love to see the detail on your 70% to 81% on time, excluding agency-initiated change orders. Do you have numbers as they relate to new buildings, new construction? Yes, um, apologies, uh, Chairperson. You were saying a new number, new construction. Sure. Um, um, I can tell you that the last three projects that we built, um, you, you, are you asking about the square footage? No, no, no. I'll, I'll repeat. I know you were, you were talking yes. to your colleague. So you, you estimated 68 to 81 percent on time delivery of capital projects for libraries, excluding agency uh, initiated change orders. Mm. But what about for new construction, new buildings? Uh, we're going to build a new library. Obviously, a lot less common than. HVAC systems or windows and doors and other sorts of projects. What is your record of on time, and I, I realize you don't have on budget numbers here, but mm. what is your record with new construction, new library buildings? Over the last five years, we've built uh, th three new library branches, um, Elmhurst, uh, in Queens, Glen Oaks, and Mariners Harbors in, in Staten Island. Um, I don't have the timeline for those three projects. But I can share that with you, certainly. So, uh, um, and I certainly can tell you uh, those that I know were, were significantly delayed of those. But also with respect to uh, significant expansions, for example, like Kew Gardens Hills, mm -hmm. again, a really, really intense and, and awful delay with that project, right? Yes, yes. And we had uh, incredible challenges with the contractor. Um, but uh, um, working very closely with uh, Dennis Walcott and his team, um, we decided to proceed and push the contractor to the end. But yes, there were extreme challenges with the contractor. The contractor. So let's talk about uh, contractors a little bit and, mm -hmm. and your role in that, because certainly, you know, we're going to talk to the library systems, but, but obviously I have, a, have a, of a past life with library systems. My sense is that libraries uh, have aspirational uh, desires to serve the people of the respective five boroughs, um, come up with some really terrific plans, mm -hmm. uh, uh, seek the funding, uh, provide an estimate, and then often rely on, on your agency to get it done. In terms of choosing the contractors, um, who does that and from what list are we choosing them and how bad does someone need to be to get taken off that list? Uh, Chairperson, as I mentioned earlier, um, this is a low bid process. So we're obligated to choose the low bid contractor and the contractor will go through various reviews, integrity checks, financial checks. 
Um, in terms of um, removing the contractor from, it is, it's not a list per se. We do have some PQLs, pre-qualified lists, but for most of our library contracts, they, it's, it's a low bid process. Um, in, in order to remove a con uh, the contractor can bid on any, on any, on any contract. The, he's not precluded, he or she is not precluded from submitting a bid. But if you have a horrific experience mm -hmm. with a contractor, uh, do you ever take them off and, and eliminate? We have defaulted contractors in the past, yes. So I know default is a little bit different than banning, right? Uh, because I also know that you're loath sometimes to default a contractor because it essentially stops the work in process Absolutely. and then even in some cases prolongs the delays that you're already experiencing as a result of a horrific contractor. That's so the default option isn't really a great option and you all don't like to use that option yourselves, right? Uh, and we have lots of experience, right? And I'm being careful not to talk about specific projects, but, but we know what we're talking about here and it happens a lot. Um, so my question is, how do you stop choosing contractors who are going to default or be so problematic that you would put them into default, but then you don't anyway because you really need them to finish the work? And then oftentimes you wind up working with the library system for years mm -hmm. with contractors who really should be in default, but you're not gonna put them in default. We could issue um, a negative performance evaluation that is entered into the vendor si system, and all, any city agency, if they bid on anything, this, this will come up as a negative against their performance. But you don't ban a contractor. Do you ever ban a contractor and say, you know what, that experience, uh, at that particular library was so awful, mm -hmm. we should never use them again, and no other agency in the city of New York should use them again. Do you do that? We cannot ban them, per se, um, chairperson. What we can do is give them a negative performance evaluation, and in the worst case scenario, default the contractor. And as you mentioned earlier, in a lot of cases, working closely with the client agency, the library system, um, and, and our team, many, some cases we make that decision to push the contractor to the end, because the default process, as you mentioned, is very long, it's, 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 risky, it's risky, and we would like to deliver the project as soon as possible to the library system. But we cannot ban the contractor. Why can't you ban a contractor? There's, there's nothing that provides in the PPP rules to ban the contractor. The mes best that we can do is issue a negative performance evaluation. So we're talking about negative performance. Let's mm -hmm. just say you found out a contractor was corrupt mm -hmm. and was actually stealing money and doing all sorts of horrible things. You, it, you couldn't even That's, say... That, that would reflect on the DOI and, and the Vendex check. So in, in that case, they would be found non-responsible. Right. And, we, and then in that case, we cannot award that contract. What's because that? We, we would not be able to award, we could not award that contract if the contractor is found non-responsible. Right, but what you seem to be saying is that in any future project, that, pro that contractor would still be eligible to apply for that project. If, if the contractor had a, a negative DOI found, a finding, no. But there is no binding, in terms negative of binding from your agency. So if you also, as you're saying that if the DOI had this negative finding, correct, that they would in fact be prohibited from uh, uh, applying for and uh, future contracts. But if your agency issues a similar, although I understand uh, maybe uh, definitionally different legally, but but a similar negative finding that your own agency uh, or the city of New York, for that matter, wouldn't ban them from applying for future contracts? It would not be, if there is a non-responsible finding by DOI, um, we would not be able to award the contract. Right, but I'm asking about your agency. So let's just say it's not a case of corruption, it's a case of incompetence. Right. And you find, DDC, that there's a negative finding there. In right? terms of performance? Yes. But you will still then entertain that contractor for future projects? No, we will seek not to use that contractor again. Seek not to use? They can bid, but we will seek not to use the contractor again. So I guess what I'm asking you is, do you then, and are you in the process of, have you ever essentially 
decided that this is someone that we'll never work with again? Yes. Okay. And if in the case of, say, Kew Gardens Hills or Hunter's Point, that is something that also could happen. Can you, in the case of, I'm sorry, chairperson. Kew Gardens Hills or Hunter's Point, that could be a potential outcome. Kew Gardens Hills, absolutely. Hunter's Point, uh, as you know, is an active construction contract. We will um, certainly do a final performance assessment once the work is completed. I would like to do a final performance assessment right now on that project. Um, and it isn't good. And, uh, and I realize that it, it, uh, it isn't just the contractor mm -hmm. on this particular case. So before I get to that, um, and again, I'm going to bounce back and forth because obviously I've got a lot of questions on Hunter's Point, but I want Councilmember Constantinis uh, uh, to ask his questions uh, perhaps about another project or projects. Um, but you mentioned the library unit at your agency, 49 staff members. Is that up or down? And do you have any plans to change that given the infusion of capital dollars that this administration and this council have been responsible for over the last couple of years and certainly going forward? We're looking to uh, backfill some vacancies that we have right now. Um, and right now we think that um, staffing level is where it should be in, in the library's unit. We have some vacancies, um, so that number will go up. So you're only planning to fill the vacancies, not actually add to the, the head count in the library's unit? At this point, yes. And you don't think you need additional people in your agency to make sure that the library systems are getting the priority level response that they deserve? Uh, that, that is correct, but to a separate unit um, that is not part of the library's group, um, to the pass-throughs and grants unit, we are adding staff. That's great, but pass-through is something that not everyone utilizes and maybe isn't utilized enough. Some like it, some don't. Mm -hmm. Are you advocating for the increase in use of pass-through? Do you support increasing the use of pass-through? Because it seems, again, anecdotally, that libraries might be better off in delivering projects that are on time and on budget if they use pass-through. Um, it's not that DDC is, is, is advocating necessarily for the use of pass-throughs. We provide more of a support function in the administrative um, goal of the systems. So if they're using either pass-through or grant, DDC will be instrumental in making sure that um, uh, the contract is processed accordingly and also that the reimbursements are provided to the systems in a timely manner. Um, I cannot say that we advocated for one or the other. I think that's a decision for the library systems to make as to what works best for them depending on the funding that's been allocated. Sure, but part of the reason they make these decisions is because of the difficulty that they have working within the current framework, right? Um, Part of the reasons, and I've also heard that for many of the reasons, because of the timing and, and perhaps they need to spend certain funds within a certain time period, but there's various reasons why those decisions are made. Um, obviously, I cannot speak to, as to the library systems. Um, they will, I'm sure, in a short time period. So I'll, I'll ask one last question before I go to my colleagues, and then I'm going to come back, because I obviously do want to drill down a little bit more on Hunter's point, but you said in your testimony that there have been lessons learned mm -hmm. and you are doing things differently in response to the experience at Hunter's Point. Mm -hmm. uh, what lessons are we talking about? What did you do wrong with respect to Hunter's Point? And I don't mean you personally, I mean the agency. Uh, and, and what now are you going to do differently citywide because Hunter's Point went awry so badly? The, we did, in fact, we did learn um, quite a few lessons from Hunter's Point. Um, one lesson that we learned and that I really want to talk about is the expectations from the client agencies. When I say client agencies, I mean the library systems. In terms of uh, what the expectations are in terms of a design and designing to budget. 
Um, um, in, in speaking with the library systems, one thing that I've been conveying is that uh, we are designing to budget, but more importantly, the functionality is very, very important because obviously um, this, the facility will have to work for the system. It has to be a facility that's acceptable to the system and to the community. But, so with the front end planning unit, we're going to make sure that the expectations are met as to budgeting. That was not done, obviously, with the Hunters Point Library. And also the conversations will have to be a collaborative one. It has to be a very distant conversation with DDC and the library system as to the expectations. What, what, what the library system is, is looking for, what is feasible. Um, for example, we, we will look not to accept any scope additions throughout construction of the project unless it's something that's really needed. And obviously that's a conversation, a conversation between us and QPL. That's one lesson learned that in the Hunters Point Library, and this, this goes back 10 years, uh, Chairperson, as you're aware, 10 years. There was no, the, the design, it was more about designing a facility. Um, we don't believe that cost was really the priority. It was more of a design than anything else. We're just making sure that cost and design go hand in hand. That's, that's one thing that we're doing differently. Um, and, also, and also baselining the design budget, baselining the construction bu budget. We have to set those parameters and, and stick to them. Um, but as I said before, when it comes to adding scope, when it comes to expectations, when it comes to how much control that we give, for example, uh, it, whether it's the consultant or the contractor making key decisions, some, some decision uh, as, as simple as it may have seemed back then concerning the glass, right now we're going to ask that these three sources that they provide are verified, not verified by them. They have to do that, but it has to be, we're gonna take the initiative and verify it ourselves. Had we done that, we would have known that it would have, it would have been impossible to source that type of glass here in the US. So we're taking those steps to really take uh, a more strong, a strong look at our process and, a, and a, uh, I guess a deeper consideration of what can transpire, what can go wrong down the line. So just because you mentioned it, mm -hmm. the glass, mm -hmm. the decision to choose that glass manufacturer was made by whom? And, and I realize that these, some of these decisions were made years ago. But, years ago, yes. But um, at that time, it was either the architect mm -hmm. or the contractor who made the decision, and DDC was not involved in that in a meaningful way, and now you're saying that because of what happened there and because of the fiasco that ensued, that now you've actually changed your policies and will be doing it differently? Yes, that is correct. We have changed our design guidelines so that we are very much involved in these types of selections with um, the contract and consultant. And that will be across the board for every project? Mm -hmm. So you won't necessarily uh, have someone else saying, we need the most special glass in the whole world. And even though Corning Incorporated is one of the largest glass manufacturers in the world and is you know, a four or five hour ride up uh, Highway 17, that we need somebody in Germany or Spain or, or Russia to make this glass. And now you're saying that if someone comes to you with that kind of a proposal, you will say, hold on, wait a minute, that is not gonna work. We need three folks who are qualified to make this glass, and, and we're gonna make sure that's the case because what happened at Hunter's Point, you know, we should never be beholden uh, to uh, what happened there. That is correct. And is that a written guideline? Is that a written policy that you've now changed? Yes, written design consultant guidelines. Um, so I, I wanna go back to that, especially your designing to budget, because obviously we did not design to budget on Hunter's Point, right? We, we had a, an estimate and then we designed, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a starship essentially um, and, and then found out that that was double the price of what we thought it was. That is correct. And that we have to avoid going forward as well, right? And how are you gonna make sure that you're actually designing to budget? And let me just say, I like the design 
of the Hunters Point Library. Uh, I think it's going to be terrific when it's done, but obviously we cannot design to budget if you are um, setting an estimate and a budget and then envisioning something that is twice the cost and saying we're going forward with that no matter what mm -hmm. um, because then you compound these delays. But you all have a role to play in making sure that things are designed to budget. So how are you going to prevent what happened at Hunters Point and do it differently going forward? Right. And, and I just want to add, Chairperson, uh, we do have also right now uh, a chief architect. Um, a chief architect joined uh, DDC about two, less than two years ago. So that's another um, resource that we have available to us. But um, so just to expand on uh, the Commissioner's comments, as far as when, when the architect is completing their design and working with DDC through this process, um, we're also doing our own independent cost analysis for the same and taking into account the constructability, the means and methods that would be required to construct a facility or building similar to Hunters Point Library. So when the engineer's estimate's coming out at 20, 20 million, 21 million, um, and then, therefore, the, the first round of bids came in at over 33. Um, there, there was a value engineering process. But what we failed to do internally at DDC was to look at that means and methods from a, from a contracting within the industry, how they could actually go through and build something like this, not just doing the simple, you know, or, or takeoff, um, things like that. So that's something that we've reevaluated. We have project controls group here at DDC that then looks into the means and methods of a vendor and how they can actually construct something like this and the challenges with that. Um, and that's something that, that if we had at the time, I think that would have certainly been able to help with, with our estimate and therefore with the appropriate budget with the architect. So we talked about DDC and contractors. With respect to Hunters Point and other library projects, has anyone ever been demoted or terminated because you believe they failed to do their jobs appropriately with respect to library projects? The, we have a whole new staff at DDC um, that has, the, there's no one that's been on involved since the original, since the contract that started two and a half years ago, and two and a half years ago from a construction standpoint. Um, one of the things that I had pointed out was with the cost estimate, and it was also tied into that was also the, uh, the schedule as well. So when we're coming out and saying we, meaning DDC, and saying this is a $20 million contract that's going to be complete in two years, um, it's not a $20 million building. It is a $30 plus million dollar building, and it should have been a three-year, and that's where, you know, DDC, my, you know, that's when we would come off with our takeoffs for saying it's a two-year contract. When you're looking at that from a constructability means and method standpoint, the budget and the schedule comes into that as well. So unfortunately, it shouldn't have been a two-year. There were mistakes that were made. Uh, we're verifying, trying to come up with w why that happened. Um, but it's not just a logistic graph of looking down and saying, okay, 20 million, this is, oh, two years, or you know, whatever that is, um, that really the time has to be taken in because this is, obviously, this is expectations, both from the council and from the community, as far as how long we're going to be out there in construction. Um, and unfortunately, this should not have been a two-year contract. Chairperson, I just, we just want to add to what Tom Foley just mentioned. Yes, there have been um, terminations and demotions, but this was uh, in, the, in the library's unit, but this is prior to uh, Hunter's Point team. Hmm. So have we taken actions in the past? Yes, we have. Okay, I'll come back to that. Councilmember King. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and again, thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. Um, I really just have one kind of a question um, for you, um, as you say, acting you're it right now, okay? And congratulations on being here. So um, having that it on your back, now you have the responsibility of figuring out what was wrong yesterday and what you gotta do today to make tomorrow better. Absolutely. So I wanna know from you, Come in because we've hear not just with library projects, but throughout any other projects that how this agency has had challenges mm -hmm. on delivering on time frames. So what would you say is maybe your top three challenges since you've come in um, and making sure that your agency is operating effectively um, and what have you done to correct them 
then I'll go from there. Thank you for that question. Okay, so um, a great challenge that I have seen um, at DDC is, I will have to say, with uh, schedule and project controls. Because um, obviously we would like to deliver these projects as quickly as possible to the communities and obviously to the elected officials. Um, under schedules and project controls, um, we have instituted um, more transparency within the agency, more transparency with also the library systems, as well as um, setting very clear expectations from each team member. We have instituted um, ver um, various discussions every week. We meet and discuss key, meet, uh, key projects. We have also instituted on the IT side um, um, a, a benchmark tr project tracking system that's now in place. I'm looking to um, put together a timeline for the entire um, project life cycle. Um, that is something that I, I, it, it, it's a challenge to set that up because obviously how do you set the targets for each step of the way? But I'm looking to institute that coming early next year. That has been a challenge in terms of what the expectations are. Because obviously even within DDC, you want to make sure that a project goes along its route as it should. And that, and, and that will minimize the l delays in delivering the project. So that's one of the challenges that I've seen. Um, you did ask for, for three. Uh, of course, the second one would be um, within our program, um, um, what is necessary within our program and what we need to strengthen. Um, I, I know the chairperson was asking about staffing. I haven't made a decision yet in terms of uh, do, whether we need more staffing in the libraries unit, but I do recognize that in certain other areas we do need more staffing to support on the library system, for example. Um, in managing their grants and pass-through um, programs, there um, we can strengthen the staff. I, I, we do need more staffing in, in other areas, and OMB has given us more staffing for the front-end planning group as well as in-house design. So when it comes to those, those two challenges, it's, it's project controls, project management, schedule management, um, certainly within staffing, there's quite a bit of work to do in terms of aligning the staff where they should be. Um, uh, those are the greatest challenges that I see right now um, that I'm, I'm working towards, and, and, and hopefully within the next six months I will see more of those results come through. But definitely internally tracking the projects and really assessing what needs to be done at a certain point. Um, that is, I have to say that is key, and that is something that we've instituted from day one. And, and, and what I've also instituted from day one is, is project delivery is, is key. Design is important, yes, but project delivery is key. We need to build these projects faster. And I think, I think we're getting there, but we do need a bit more work to do. Okay, so that leads me to ask you, the solutions that you've come up with, how effective have they been? And if I'm hearing you, I heard you say six months. Is that your timeline to make sure these changes <clears throat> are in place, or is there a timeline to make sure that what you're implementing has an effective date um, that you can clear up you know, all your backlog and all the issues that you have with building, not just libraries, but mm -hmm. some of the other construction that goes on in the city of New York? I mean, it'll be difficult to see uh, let's say, for example, um, the results of front-end planning over, let's say, six months or so. Um, um, front-end planning or in-house design, per se. But we have seen um, right now, it's very preliminary, it's very early on in the process, but our in-house design team, we have seen that they can design much faster, per se. Than, than, than having a consultant on board. I would say that so far, the numbers that we have seen, as I said, very preliminary, it seems that a third of the time that a consultant would design certain projects of the same magnitude, let's say two to three million dollar project, we're able to design those in a third of the time. But it's not enough of a sample, I feel, just yet, to make that final decision as to um, is this really um, going to be the standard for in-house design for certain projects. I do need that time to assess down the line exactly how many projects we have designed, how quickly, and the types of projects, and then make a conclusion to that as to where, whether I need more staffing or whether I need to realign the staffing. So six months, I, I would need six more months just to see where we're at, mm -hmm. and then reassess and move forward. Okay, um, another question I have is that, is there anything that we and the council can do 
or is there anything that you can do as the commissioner mm -hmm. um, to eliminate some of the the bureaucracy that happens within and do it. I heard him talk, I heard this uh, chair talking about being able to just technically just fire somebody who's just been messing it up as opposed to just put the letter in their jacket and sending it to another agency and say you guys handle it. What can you guys come up with in your layout and your plan or your charter or your operation codes to say we're not going to tolerate this anymore just so we can expedite projects because what we don't want to see happen which we hear in a lot of hearings things get pushed to the next agency to that agency to deal with and we're saying to you as a commissioner how do you create a system within your system that says if I'm going to stand before or sit before the council and have to answer questions then I got to have the power to make real decisions and if I got to say no to something or, or eliminate something you should have the power to do that so how do we help with that process or do you have something or are you willing and capable to do so well, so far, the council has helped DDC in, in supporting um, the funding for front end planning and in-house design. And, and the council right now in the task force is working with us and OMB to look at, as, as you said, the bureaucracy and, and, and the process and what can be improved. So in that respect, I, fr from our perspective, I think the council has helped us and is helping us. In terms of internally within the agency, um, I agree with you, um, I would have to see I don't believe in, uh, I believe in moving forward, and if changes have to be made within DDC, I will certainly take that on, but I will also need to make the right changes and have the tools where, where I can make those assessments. And as I, I mentioned earlier, tracking the projects, understanding exactly where the issues are occurring. These tools that right now, these program management tools that we're working on will give us that access to then make those decisions as to what changes we should make. As, as New York City has pretty much one of the largest library systems on the planet, um, have you ever spoken to any other city who has a very large system of what works for them um, in order to deliver projects, basically, basically when it comes to building in our, our library systems? What, what are good practices that might work? I have not yet, but mm -hmm. I certainly will. I have been talking to the industry at length about many um, issues concerning project delivery, um, but I certainly will um, reach out. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going I'm to wrap up and just um, say, And just oh, one more thing, how yes. you can help us design build. Okay. I, I know you support design build. Um, I, we need as many tools as possible so that we make sure we have um, the, the best contractors, the best consultants. Um, any support you can give us on design build will be great. Okay. Well, thank you for your answers, and thank you all for testimony, testifying today. And Mr. Chair, thank you so much, and again, happy Hanukkah to all. Thank you. Um, so what, what kind of priority is given to library projects? Obviously, you have an enormous portfolio. Library capital projects are a relatively small portion of your overall program. Well, for public buildings is 30 percent. So What's that? 30 percent for public buildings. It's not um, overall, it's 15 percent of the agency, 30 percent for public buildings. Right. And but in your agency, libraries are about 15 percent. 15 percent. Right. Uh, so where are libraries in terms of your prioritization? Every project is a priority to us, every single project. So you feel like within your agency, the library projects are at the highest level of priority that they need to be, and the library systems feel that level of priority? I can say absolutely yes. And with respect to these projects that seem And I to have also given assurance, obviously, to, to Iris Wanshaw, Dennis Walcott, and um, Linda Johnson I've connected with. I haven't had time to talk to her too much, but I will very soon. Um, but yes, I have assured them that it's a priority. I'm there personally to work with them. Um, so yes, libraries are a priority for us. Um, yes, no, I don't doubt that they are a priority. My, my uh, concern is that they be given the highest level of priority that any other project gets. And, and that the library systems feel that, that level of uh, prioritization. And with respect to the projects that seem to go on forever, uh, and there are too many of those, and the libraries, uh, and obviously we'll be talking to them, 
feeling that the agency, your agency, has the dexterity to be able to respond to things that are horribly wrong and correct them in a timely fashion. A, do you believe that you have that, and do you believe that others think that you have that? I do not believe that we have the dexterity right now, um, but we're working on it in terms of addressing, in terms of delivering um, library projects. When there are scope additions, for example, when projects are not funded adequately, um, we did not have that dexterity before, but I think that right now, with the tools that we have in place, we hope to be in a better position to manage those expectations. So I appreciate your, uh, your honesty, but I want to talk a little bit about um, sort of the funding mm -hmm. imbalances or shortages that happen and why they happen, why they come to pass, uh, because you just referenced it. But in my experience, um, in many cases, Council members are, are asked uh, for a certain level of funding because there is an estimate. Um, we believe that we are appropriately funding the project, only to be told that we are not. Um, That's correct. Is your agency going to change the way it does business with respect to that? Because in some ways it's inaccurate to call it a funding shortage when when the elected officials believe actually that they've that met the funding expectation not even once, but several times, only to have the goalpost pushed back even further. And that is correct, Cha Chairperson, and this is why at the pre-CPI, even before we receive a draft CPI, we are open to us working with the library system in order to assess the scope and the budget like that, your expectations will, will be managed in terms of what's, what can be delivered. And I realize that some of this uh, pre predates your mm -hmm. uh, current uh, uh, position, but for example, I have been told at very high levels by your agency about a projected completion date of a library, only to have that then revised, uh, not by months, but by years. How is it that the Department of Design and Construction could tell me that you, you expect uh, completion of a project or substantial completion of a project and then have that be off by years? Uh, respectfully, count, uh, Chairperson, I would not say we're off by years. Um, when uh, you and I visited the site over the summer, um, I mentioned to you that the project will be substantially completed late summer of 2019, 2018, I'm sorry. Um, the original completion date of this project was earlier this year, 2017, and the project will be completed um, mid, uh, late summer of 2018. So uh, let me just I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I, you know, I can only go by what I have informed you, where you were informed previously, I cannot speak to that, but I can tell you that at our site visit, I specifically um, mentioned to you that the project will be completed late summer of next year, and we are trying our best to stay with that date. Right, so uh, to be clear, I'm not referring to something you said to me. Uh, it was uh, uh, someone else uh, at your agency, and that was in fact off. Um, by years, okay. particularly if your time frame, which now you did share with me, mm -hmm. yes. is also delayed for any purpose or reason. Uh, so do you now, at this hearing, believe that this library will open in calendar 2018? Is that your belief? I can say that DDC will substantially complete our portion of the work by August 2018 and turn it over to QPL for QPL to do their fit out. 
So I cannot it, speak to when the library will open. I think that that's a question more for Dennis Walcott and his team. But I can say that we will complete our portion of the work by August of 2018. Right. So depending on how long the, the library needs to uh, be in the building before it is open, that's and that correct. is assuming that there are no changes whatsoever uh, from here until then, correct. Uh, we are probably looking at a 2019 um, uh, opening of the library. Um, obviously, we'll talk to the library uh, shortly about that, but uh, that is a, a very substantial delay off of a very substantial delay on top of, uh, uh, on top of a, a delay. One very specific question that was brought to me by a constituent. The glass is all on site, yet you, uh, well not you personally, but uh, the westernmost facing window is not being installed. Why are you leaving that gaping hole in the building when it is cold and wet and raining and snowing and people are desperate for you to close up that building and I would imagine there's a lot of work that you can't do as long as it's still snowing into a library. Generally you don't want snow into a library, right? Correct. So why, if the glass is all there, are you not installing it? So council member, the, uh, the western portion is open. Some of that has, some of the glass has been installed. The, the middle cavity has not. They're currently doing IT security through in the higher elevations within the, uh, within the library. Um, and they're using the man lift that's located, two man lifts that are located outside on the western side um, through that cavity to work uh, at the ceiling level for the security. The frames uh, for those, for the glass is currently being installed um, last week and this week and that should be completed by the end of this month and then the glass would be, would be installed on that western side by the end of January. So this, this, they're working within the facility. The, uh, the, the library is protected in the sense of from the elements, um, but that's, that's a, you know, we've discussed it certainly with the contractor. Once that IT, once that work is done at the higher elevation, then they will be closing that up on the glass on that western portion and then starting the mill work inside. So is the building opening being further delayed because you aren't able to close the building at this point? No. And the cost of the library, at this point, do you anticipate it rising any more based on the work completed and the work yet to be completed? Not with the current uh, budget that we have right now as far as the estimates, both for the safety enhancements and stadium seating. Of current, we, we, um, we don't ex expect it to go up any further. And do you have faith in the folks doing the work to complete the project in the time frame that the acting commissioner just gave me? We do, um, and we continue to have the conversation not only with the contractor and the subcontractors, but also the bonding company that is obviously fully uh, engaged on site. And um, we continue to pay the bonding company directly. And, um, and they are then dispersing the checks internally to the various subs and the uh, GC. So I get updates from the department on the progress of this work. And I'm wondering if you are open to and willing to make updates available to the public uh, maybe not as specific and detailed as the reports that I get on a weekly basis on the Hunters Point Library, but you talk about transparency. There's obviously a great deal of frustration in my community, but other communities as well. Why not make that uh, something that you do for the community and, and release those reports? Be more than happy to do any outreach that's required. Um, or suggested, and as we had talked during the walkthrough, I will. I I am responsible for the work at the site. I am more than happy at any public meeting to be present and to go over um, the challenges that we faced, um, and along with the expectations from a, a scheduled completion date. So I, I look. I I would welcome a town hall style meeting on this project, but I think even before that, 
because a lot of people can't make town hall meetings, and quite frankly, I don't want to have a town hall meeting on Hunter's Point until that building is closed and we can actually feel very confident in telling people in the community when they might anticipate their library, because as you know, uh, they have been told so many dates, and none of them have proven to be true, and so I don't feel comfortable going to the community with a date until I see much more progress. But before we do that, releasing reports, not just on the Hunters Point Library, but, but maybe on all of your capital projects, uh, which is a level of transparency that we don't currently see. Absolutely. Well, our office will be preparing uh, monthly newsletters to go out to the community, and we're, we're hoping, well, we'll expand on that as necessary. So you're committing to doing that for the Hunters Point Library? Yes. That's great. Um, and you're open to doing it for other library projects as well? Absolutely. Um, and, and we'll reach out to you uh, before putting out that first newsletter and, and coordinate that through your office as well, Chairperson. Uh, great. Um, well, look, we have a, a long way to go. I know there are other uh, efforts underway, but uh, there has to be trust and and there has to be a belief on the part of elected officials, council members obviously in particular, uh, but also from the public in your agency. Uh, because if, if there isn't, then it could actually harm our efforts to attract more capital funding for libraries. Obviously, I'm deeply concerned about what happened at Hunter's Point, but also libraries all across the systems. But but even more so, this inability of this agency to do library projects in the way that they should threatens overall support for library capital funding because we don't want anyone to say, why would I provide funding when we don't actually believe that DDC is going to be able to do the right thing with our money and we're not going to see the project. We're not going to see it for years. We're not going to see it while we're still in office. We're not going to see it uh, when we promised our constituents they would see it. That is a real existential threat to the support for library capital funding. And we have done so much over the last four years uh, to really build up that uh, well of support. And, and now it's incumbent upon the agency recognizing that it failed too often uh, to implement the changes necessary to make sure that we're not having Hunter's Point Library-like delays and issues going forward. So with that, I want to thank uh, you all for being here. And uh, we'll hear from the library systems now. But thank you for your um, testimony and, in some cases, your brutal honesty, uh, Acting Commissioner. And uh, we will definitely be following up on, on the transparency items as well as some of the other uh, requests for information that uh, you said would be forthcoming in terms of on budget in particular. Yes, thank you. Fair enough. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Dennis Walcott from the Queens Library, Linda Johnson from the Brooklyn Public Library, and Risa Honig from the New York Public Library. Who wants to go first? You guys choose for yourselves. Good afternoon, Councilman. I'm happy to start.
My name is Linda Johnson, and I'm the president and CEO of Brooklyn Public Library. Thank you, Chairs Van Bramer and King, and the entire council for your commitment to our city's public libraries. I am here today to testify about library construction projects, the progress we have made with our capital program, and the considerable infrastructure challenges the library continues to face. Libraries are an essential public resource. More patrons than ever are walking through our doors, and we are striving to meet their growing needs. We are indebted to you, the speaker, and the mayor for, you, for your outstanding work to help us meet these challenges. In addition to allowing us to achieve universal six-day service, the city has made significant investments in library infrastructure. Our inclusion in the 10-year plan three years ago was extremely encouraging. Brooklyn Public Library received $100 million in funding over 10 years to overhaul five libraries, Eastern Parkway, New Lots, Canarsie, Brownsville, and New Utrecht. Additionally, with your help, the fiscal year 2018 budget included an extraordinary boost, $30 million to help the library address system-wide critical maintenance, $10 million for our central library renovation, and funding from individual members. You and your colleagues have heard us speak many times about the specific infrastructure hurdles we face in branches, in our branches. You have seen these challenges yourselves, and you have used your discretionary funds to help us fix them, and we are grateful, and it is making a difference. Just a few years ago, Brooklyn Public Library carried $300 million in unfunded capital needs for the 59 libraries in our system. With the help of the city, Albany, and private philanthropy, as well as creative library projects, we have reduced the need to $240 million. You have helped BB BPL enter its most significant era of rebuilding in recent memory. Over the next 10 years, one-third of our system will have been rebuilt or renovated. Innovative library projects in Brooklyn Heights, Sunset Park, Greenpoint, and Brower Park will add new state-of-the-art libraries to our footprint and reduce unfunded capital needs by tens of millions of dollars. As we have discussed numerous times, revenue from the sale of Brooklyn Heights Library will allow us to improve several branches that are badly in need of repair and to replace and expand our Sunset Park Library. Our collaboration with the Fifth Avenue Committee and extensive community input will result in a new 21,000 square foot library topped with 40 units of permanently affordable housing. An interim location is set to open by the end of March and we look forward to beginning construction soon thereafter. At the end of October, we broke ground for the new Greenpoint Library, a model of sustainable development that will provide significantly more space, indoor and out, for expanded programs and activities and a special collection that will increase awareness and stewardship of the local environment. Funding for this facility included a $5 million grant from the Greenpoint Community Environmental Fund, the outcome of a settlement with ExxonMobil over its oil spill in Greenpoint. The new Brower Park Library is also being built through a new partnership that will save the city funding. Brower, the least branch and our smallest, requires a renovation that would cost over $8 million. Relocating the branch to the Brooklyn Children's Museum will ensure a similarly sized new branch in a city-owned building and an ongoing library presence for the neighborhood. Thanks to mayoral, council, and borough president funding, this $3 million project is moving forward and an RFP to, de to design the new space was released last week. Additionally, I am pleased to report that two new small libraries will come online in the next few years. A new leased branch approved as part of the Brooklyn Heights Initiative will serve a growing community in Dumbo and Vinegar Hill. The Brooklyn Cultural District will house a rent-free branch 
focused on cultural offerings at 300 Ashland Place, increasing Brooklyn Public Library's total number of locations from 59 to 61. We are also beginning a sorely needed renovation of our flagship library at Grand Army Plaza. The first phase of renovation will launch in 2018. Not for half a century has Brooklyn seen such a significant addition of new and improved spaces to our portfolio. Modern, flexible, thoughtfully designed, and inspiring libraries so badly needed by the many communities we serve. Yet at the same time, we still must contend with staggering capital needs that are not close to resolving. Decades of, of underfunding have left us with $240 million in unmet capital needs system-wide, approximately one-third of which are emergency infrastructure projects like boilers, HVAC systems, roofs, and security upgrades. We are still facing deferred maintenance crisis that is impacting most neighborhoods in the borough. With a physical plant of more than 1.1 million square feet, we are constantly working to maintain state of good repair. Our average branch is 68 years old with at least $1 million in needed upgrades and one quarter of them require more than $5 million. 18 of our branches are beautiful Carnegie libraries that are over 100 years old and therefore even more costly to preserve. Every year, our, building ex ex every year our, building experience un our buildings experience unplanned closures, and we lost hundreds of hours that should have been open to the community. Many of our major systems are not functioning at all. We have branches that are operating with temporary chillers in the summer and heaters in the winter that are well beyond their useful life. While we have begun to make progress, our overall funding level continually forces us to triage only the most serious projects and leave the countless critical infrastructure needs and preventative work unaddressed. We spend much of our time and resources responding to emergencies. The lack of a reliable source of recurring funding also makes it impossible for us to manage capital projects efficiently. Urgently needed improvements are often delayed over the slightest change in scope because we are not able to address routine adjustments and overruns with dollars budgeted for the coming year. We simply do not have the flexibility other agencies have. In total, we face shortfalls of more than $18 million throughout the borough. The bulk of, this, of the funding we received last year was spent keeping the design efforts moving forward on projects that were initiate, initiated years ago. We have projects planned for nearly half of our libraries that are on, on hold or delayed. While there is no single and easy solution to address the capital predicament we face, there are a few steps I believe we must take. First and foremost, a large recurring budget allocation for libraries must be placed in the 10-year plan, capital plan. We not only need an adequate level of funding, we need to be able to accurately plan our program. Most city agencies have funding in every year of the 10-year plan. So when a project inevitably runs into a shortfall in the design process, they have money to cover it and complete the design phase, ultimately reaching construction. Libraries, on the other hand, must wait until the end of each year and divert our one-time allocations to plug holes, constantly topping off the project budget to allow design to continue to move forward. In some cases, we do not have enough to reach construction. This process is inefficient and ultimately more costly. Operating under this structure forces us to maintain our physical plant piecemeal, focusing on individual systems rather than, rather than on a building as a whole. Recurring allocations every year would not only ensure that we fully fund our projects, but would enable us to deal with our buildings holistically rather than applying emergency uh, fixes. This was the intention behind the five $20 million branch overhauls that were funded in, the fisc in fiscal 2016's 10-year capital plan. 
approaching our building upgrades comprehensively is the most efficient and prudent way to maintain our physical plant. In addition, if we had the flexibility to separate design and construction budgets, we would prevent delays in our projects. We could make progress on many more projects if we were given the latitude to fully fund design and move forward with the understanding that the construction budget will be shored up separately. In addition, given the growth in our capital effort, it is imperative we have the flexibility to pursue new approaches, from embracing additional public-private partnerships and collaborations to taking on more pass-throughs, more pass-through projects ourselves. We are committed to doing our part to meet capital challenges through innovative projects and our continual search for new sources of funding. Coupled with a long-term and sustained investment by the City of New York, as well as the process improvements and flexibility, I am confident we can build upon the progress that we have made. I am heartened by the Council's focus on the library capital projects and your recognition that we must collectively rise to this challenge. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Good afternoon. My name is Risa Hunt. Is your mic on? Sorry, it's my first time. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name is Risa Honig, and I am Vice President for Capital Planning and Construction of the New York Public Library. I would like to thank Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, Majority Leader Jimmy Van Bramer, Subcommittee Chair Andy King, and the entire City Council for holding this hearing. I appreciate the opportunity to testify and would like to thank the Council for your steadfast support on libraries. We are here today to discuss library construction projects, our successes, and the challenges of the City process. As you well know, the New York Public Library System is massive and requires significant ongoing improvements to ensure that libraries are functional, safe spaces for our patrons. Our physical infrastructure is significant with 93 buildings and 71 current capital projects underway, including 29 in the Bronx, 35 in Manhattan, and 7 on Staten Island. These current projects represent $565 million in total cost. We are excited to provide an overview of our capital program, tell you more about our few major projects, and share some of the innovative ways we're working with the city to improve the capital process. Over the past few years, with actions by the city, we've been able to advance our capital program. The inclusion of libraries in the city's 10-year capital strategy was a key step forward. We are grateful to the mayor and the city council for working together to see that the city's three library systems are included in the city capital planning conversation. As a result of the $100 million that we received in the 10-year plan in 2015, we are renovating five of our historic Carnegie libraries in high-need neighborhoods. The libraries are Hunts Point and Melrose in the Bronx, Fort Washington and 125th Street in Manhattan, and Port Richmond on Staten Island. We hope to remain part of the city's 10-year capital planning conversation and to build on the progress we have made over the last two years. As I mentioned earlier, the New York Public Library currently has 71 active capital projects in its portfolio, totaling $565 million. Our biggest is the Midtown Campus Project, which includes a complete renovation of our largest circulating branch, the Mid-Manhattan Library, and an extensive upgrade and renovation of the Stephen A. Schwarzman Building. The Mid-Manhattan Library is currently in construction, and SASB is in the early concept phase. Some other projects that I'd like to highlight are Van Cortland in the Bronx, McCombs Bridge, Inwood and Schomburg in Manhattan and Charleston on Staten Island. At Van Cortland, we are relocating the existing library three blocks away to a new larger space. Scheduled to open in 2019, the Van Cortland branch 
will more than double in size and features an outdoor area as well as more space for reading and programs. The McCombs Bridge branch in Harlem will also be relocated to a larger 3,375 square foot state-of-the-art space. At nearly five times the size of the current 685 square foot branch, it will have more than double the number of computers and a dedicated space for children and teens. We are currently in the design phase of that project. Both McCombs Bridge Library and Van Cortlandt Library have benefited by leveraging city capital dollars with state and private funding. The Inwood Branch redevelopment project in Upper Manhattan features a mixed-use development that will house a brand new library, 100% affordable housing, and a universal pre-K site. This innovative project is a partnership with New York City Department of Housing, Preservation and Development and the Robin Hood Foundation. The new 10,000 square foot Charleston branch on Staten Island is beginning construction late 2018 and will have almost 3,000 square feet dedicated to children and teens, as well as a larger program rooms to accommodate the needs for more ESOL classes, art exhibits, senior programming, and more. And lastly, this fall we completed an extensive two-year, $22.3 million major renovation of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. The project preserved the 112-year-old landmark building, adding new research space, conditioned storage for collections, and critical upgrades to building systems like HVAC, fire alarms, and security. The impact of improved facilities is clear. Circulation, program attendance, and visits grow significantly after capital investment. Following our Stapleton branch renovation on Staten Island, we saw a 177% spike in program attendance, a 33% increase in visits, and a 51% increase in circulation. After our Washington Heights library was renovated, we saw a 105% increase in program attendance, a 47% improvement in visits, and 45% increase in circulation. New Yorkers want beautiful, inspiring, functional, and safe public spaces in their neighborhoods, and when they have them, they flock to them. As you can see by the numbers, New Yorkers need their libraries, and we must continue to invest in the physical aspect of our branches. At New York Public Library, the average age of our libraries is 67 years old, with many branches dating back more than 100 years. Additionally, many branches need to be reconfigured for how New Yorkers use libraries today, with increased program space, upgraded technology, and ADA access. Capital funding is necessary for critical repairs and improvements, but equally important is a city capital process that works. At NYPL, we know that when we do projects as pass-throughs, we can deliver them more cheaply and expeditiously than when they are managed by the city. Our data shows that the DDC average project duration of six years and two months compared to NYPL at two years and four months. The DDC average project cost is $724 per square foot compared to NYPL's $411 per square foot. Our Roosevelt Island branch is a simple interior build out of an existing 5,200 square foot space. The design process began in December 2014. At that time, the project was expected to be completed by the end of 2017. Almost three years later, construction has not commenced. The new construction completion date is late 2019. DDC's reason for the extensive delays include the addition of a hearing loop in the community room and complex code and procurement issues. These should not be issues that would impact the schedule in a meaningful way. At our Ottentort for Branch Library, we need to close the branch in order to make critical updates to the fire alarm system. We plan for the redirection of our staff and patrons in August, but four months later, DDC has not scheduled the closing date and the construction paperwork has now expired and must be refiled. At New Amsterdam Library, 
the constructability phase was supposed to take place one month and was delayed six months. This, de this delay resulted in the heating and cooling system breaking in the middle of the summer, forcing the branch to unexpectedly close for months. These are just a few examples of where the process needs to be improved. While we are thankful for the ability to manage projects as pass-throughs, we must upfront a significant amount of money to do so, and this is simply not feasible for the library. We currently have $192 million in pass-throughs in the pipeline including the Mid-Manhattan Library, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, the fire alarm at the Stephen A. Schwarzman Building, and the third floor of the Washington Heights Library. However, we need long-term sustainable solutions so we can use the public funding that has been granted to us in a way that allows us to maximize the city's investment. There is a tremendous opportunity for us to think more creatively about how to manage and deliver on capital projects. And we're eager to work with our partners in city government to continue to explore new solutions. Having discussed these issues, we've had numerous conversations with DDC Acting Commissioner Anna Barrio, who has been very receptive to finding better, more efficient ways to manage library capital projects. We are currently in conversation with the commissioner and her staff about the possibility of doing library pass-through projects as cultural grants. The city believes that this change will reduce the project timeline by months. While this change is a significant improvement, it only applies to a small number of projects in our capital portfolio and doesn't remedy the issue. For more than a century, NYPL's network of libraries across the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island have served as powerful engines of individual and community empowerment and development. But they require capital investment and a city capital process to ensure they can continue to provide all New Yorkers with the tools and the essential public spaces they need and deserve. We are grateful for the Council's longtime support of libraries and look forward to working with you and our other partners in government to increase our ability to provide world-class library service to New Yorkers in well-maintained, safe, and accessible spaces. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important issue. I remain available to answer any questions. Thank you. That was the first time you've ever testified, right? Yes. You did great. Thank you. I was a little nervous. <laughs> uh, it didn't come through at all. On TV, it's going to look like you're a professional. There you go. Um, do you really have a library that's 685 square feet? Is that what you said? Yes. The Currently, our McCombs branch is, in fact, 685 square feet. It's in the Harlem houses, and in, it is, oh, I see. was a studio apartment sure. on the ground level. That is really tiny. It may be even smaller than the Broad Channel uh, yeah, well, Community Library. Uh -huh. Dennis? Chair, thank you, and good afternoon to you and to the other members who were here before, and we thank you for your leadership, and in all honesty, we appreciate both the support and the advocacy on your behalf to all of our libraries. You have been tremendous in both uh, the allocation of dollars, but as well as the allocation of voice to the importance of libraries and how they serve our community. Uh, I would like to take a second to introduce two people who are relatively new to the team. I think one may have been here for a hearing before, but they're critical to the discussion that we're having today, and that's Lou Finkelman, who is our Chief Operating Officer, who started in March of this year, and then John Catamaris, who is our VP of Capital, who also happens to be an architect as well who started several months ago, and they are critical members of our leadership team, along with uh, Nick Buron, who you know is our chief librarian. Uh, as you know, my name is Dennis Walcott, and I'm president and CEO of Queens Library. Uh, thank you for inviting me to testify today on a very important topic, the library construction process. Uh, maintaining our aging infrastructure is both a short-term and a long-term challenge for the library. 
We are responsible for maintaining 65 total sites, of which 62 are full-service libraries. The average community library in our system is 61 years old. Uh, they are heavily used, and most were not constructed to accommodate the burgeoning traffic we see today due to the significant growth in population and demand for our programs and services. Additionally, the vast majority of libraries are poorly configured to meet the demands of this digital age that we're in right now. Therefore, we are faced with the daunting challenges of modernizing our facilities, maintaining our critical infrastructure, and expanding our public spaces in order to thrive in the 21st century and continue to provide the first-class service our customers have come and should demand to expect. The mayor and the city council's capital investment in libraries over the last several years have been significant and greatly appreciated. Thank you personally and thank you to all for your contribution and your advocacy. Additionally, we are fortunate to have a strong partner in Queens with our borough president, Melinda Katz, whose funding in addition to the city councils and the mayors has allowed us to continue tackling the issues that I have outlined. However, capital needs continue to exist. For the upcoming fiscal year, the library has identified $68 million in additional capital needs and an additional $375 million worth of capital needs over the next 10 years. And I look forward to discussing those needs in greater detail at our preliminary budget hearing scheduled for March. Today's hearing gives us an opportunity to have an open discussion on how we can make the capital construction process for libraries more efficient in terms of both cost and project duration. I want to take a moment also to compliment our Acting Commissioner Barrio for her collaboration and leadership in attempting to address the challenges that we face. For example, the library and DDC now hold monthly instead of quarterly meetings where we discuss all of our library's active projects and strive to resolve outstanding project issues, some of which you talked about earlier and we will talk about in a little while, in an expeditious fashion. Uh, the Commissioner is taking a reform-minded approach for tackling these issues in various stages of the construction process and communication between our agencies has greatly improved. DDC currently manages 56 projects for Queens Library with a portfolio value of $151 million. When combined with Brooklyn Public and New York Public, the DDC Library Unit is doing a great deal of work for all of us. Providing the library systems with greater flexibility and managing their own projects is extremely critical. While there are limitations on the resources we have to manage such projects, by allowing us the ability to manage additional projects and simplifying the process to do so, we can get more projects completed in a timely manner and prioritize projects more efficiently. Of the utmost importance is providing the library systems with the ability to address time-sensitive work, such as installing new, boil new boilers, pumps and roofs uh, in an expedited fashion, expedited fashion. We need to work together with all the stakeholders promptly to develop a process that will enable the library systems to perform such critical work expeditiously rather than having to wait years for the work to be performed. Certain elements of the construction review process need to be further studied as well. For example, issuing a change order on a project can add significant time to its completion. There are various things that happen that necessitate a change order to a project, such as scope change, field conditions, or other type examples where a change order is required. However, when the approval process for a change order takes six months to a year to complete, that is not in the best interest of the public or any other stakeholders in the project. In order to minimize the need for change orders, which can lead to project delays and drive up costs, we are working with DDC to ensure that library, the library provides maximum input at the earliest stages of the design phase. Having our needs and vision of all of the design elements incorporated at the beginning of the process will help mitigate potential delays to the projects. In this regard, the library is developing a far more expansive list of design standards for projects, which will also help alleviate many of the issues that have led to delays on our prior projects. Finally, remaining in the city's 10-year capital plan is of paramount importance for having a solid library construction process. Projects will not commence unless all funding is in place and will be abruptly stopped if a shortfall presents itself at any time during the project. 
when the library is forced to fundraise for its capital plan in a piecemeal manner, relying on individual council members, which we truly appreciate, to fund multi-million dollar projects, our buildings will rapidly fall out of the state of good repair. Being funded in the city's 10-year capital plan is vital for libraries to plan effectively and to initiate much needed critical infrastructure or expansion projects. All the suggestions that I've outlined today, I believe, will lead to a more efficient construction process, which will serve to increase our commitment rates and bring renewed confidence to our community stakeholders and our customers. I look forward to working with my colleagues and partners in government to bring further reform to this process. Again, thank you, Chair Van Bramer and Chair King, as well as the council members for the opportunity to testify and I would be happy to answer any questions you or your committee members may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to all three of you. Um, skip. The recent infusion, 110 million in capital, um, how will you use that? Is that going to specific projects uh, the three systems can identify right now? Sure, I'll take the first stab. We'll be using that to make sure that if there are gaps, if bids come in over the expected numbers that we are plugging it with those. So for example, in a number of our projects, we've identified where there are gaps in funding and we've used those dollars to fund those gaps. So we have been very active in working both internally as well as externally to fill those holes and that's how it's being used. So yours is not for any dedicated specific library projects but instead sort of a plugging the holes? Well, both that as well as, say, for example, Rosedale, we had a definite need there, and so we're using it for that project. Uh, but there are other projects that are coming in overbid, or we have to fill the holes, so we're using it as well for them. Linda? Yes, we are um, planning to do five um, full branch overhauls. Um, the libraries that will be um, addressed are the New Lots Library, the New Utrecht Library, Canarsie, Brownsville, and Eastern Parkway. And those projects are gut renos or yeah. right, essentially? Yeah. Um, while we also filled holes on certain projects, we are planning on renovations, um, critical maintenance renovations, for about 12 of our branches, and those include um, boiler replacements, AC, HVAC upgrades, um, and ADA. Um, some of that is West New Brighton branch in Staten Island will receive an elevator. Um, we are looking also at Chatham Square branch, um, Clawson's Point, Hamilton Grange, um, across, across our system. Sure. Um, and just to go back to Queens, sure. can you give any more uh, branch specificity uh, like the other two systems have? Since I've been handed the sheet, yes, I'd be glad to do that. Uh, so for example, in Far Rockaway, we're filling a shortfall there. In Glendale, interior renovation, we're filling a shortfall there. Uh, with Howard Beach, we have dealt with uh, the windows and door replacement, so we're working on that. Uh, in Jackson Heights, we're looking at an expansion interior renovation, Seaside, a roof replacement, uh, Seaside also window and door replacement, St. Albans, a roof replacement, Steinway phase two of a renovation. And then one of the things I don't think we've talked about before, and we've used the money for this, as well as we're developing an operations center, uh, which will be near Kennedy Airport, where we'll have our operations hub, which will then free up space in the libraries where we have things stored. And then with that space that we free up, we'll be using that for programs and expanded services within those libraries where we have snowblowers and other types of things. Terrific. Um, Excuse me, Chairman. Um, my staff thinks that perhaps I answered the wrong question. Um, if we're talking about the $110 million that was issued to the three library systems in, for fiscal 2018, um, our $30 million um, is being used for shortfalls, and $10 million of it is going toward the central project. 
Okay. And one additional thing with some of the money as well, we have new buildings, so Rego Park, for example, where we announced that in conjunction with a town hall that was held. So we have Rego Park that will be as a result of this. And then we're putting in nursing stations as well, both in uh, Central and Flushing and Long Island City and Peninsula. So again, a variety of different purposes with the use of those dollars. Rego Park is now fully funded? Rego Park is fully funded. Wow. I have a long and torturous history with that uh, project Rigo Park. as well. We got a number um, of checks that we can give you. Rego Park is now fully funded. Uh, that is good news. Um, uh, now, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the commitment rates. Um, uh, obviously, we're going to talk a little bit about DDC and, and its work um, and uh, where it falls short in assisting you in doing your work. But uh, uh, some folks have pointed to uh, the relatively low commitment rates, and I wanted to ask you um, why that is in your estimation for your systems. Whoever would like to go yep. first. Well, you know, really we feel this is a question more for DDC than for any of us here. Um, we will say that in terms of our pass-through projects, we expect that that will really boost the commitment rate um, shortly, given that we're in process of getting, getting certain things approved. But um, in terms of the DDC managed projects, um, we do have quite a bit in design. There's just, it's not moving as quickly as we all would have hoped into construction and registering contracts. And um, not unlike what we heard earlier, a lot has to do with procurement methods, but also has to do with process. Does anyone want to expand upon that? We have a similar story to tell. Um, it's hard to understand why certain things um, progress at the pace that they do, but um, it takes a very long time to get um, through the design process and um, and to get to construction can take four years, um, which, um, needless to say, drives up the cost of the project, which pushes us back into the cycle of looking for additional funds to complete. Um, and so we're on a, a some, somewhat of a treadmill. Yeah, I, mean, I just add to that that I think one of the things we've done at Queens Library is try to, as I indicated in my testimony, is to meet with DDC on a regular basis, so that way, as I indicated before, we were doing it on a quarterly basis, now we're doing it on a monthly basis, and also we've put in place what I call a protocol system in that at the various staff levels now, we have active communication with each other, bumping up to uh, Tom and Lou, John and his team with the DDC team, and then to the commission and myself, and we sit down and try to resolve those issues that are delaying that process so we can increase our commitment rate, and I think that's where we're going right now, and we're seeing some early success as far as trying to resolve those thorny issues, and then I think also with the work around specific projects and what's the delay, why the delay is there, and then how do we solve that delay. I think that's what we've evolved with the new set of eyes, and that's why I wanted to introduce Lou and John, because they bring a seasoned pair of eyes from different perspectives that we didn't necessarily have before, and it's not knocking them before. It's just how we're approaching it now and how we improve on it now. Well, I, I asked the question because as we at the Council have looked at capital system-wide and citywide, uh, the commitment rates for libraries are lower than for many agencies, and others have pointed out that discrepancy, but uh, what, what I liked uh, from uh, your answer is that that is, is not a reflection on the libraries uh, per se, but in fact, once again, we're stuck in, in limbo quite often on these projects, and, and that is keeping the commitment rates low. There's also, um I think perhaps some terminology issues and what commitment rate means, what on time means. Um, so, you know, we heard some numbers um, earlier and they're difficult to reconcile with the numbers that we're looking at. I was just about to go to those numbers, <laughs> Linda Johnson. And uh, um, so 
68% for BPL, 70% for NYPL, 81% for Queens Library. Um, on time capital projects, notwithstanding the 54% that DDC identified as agency driven change orders that then presumably forced those projects to be uh, no longer on time. Those numbers seem high to me. What is your interpretation of those numbers and your experience? For me, at least, it's the first I'm hearing those specific numbers. I just know, based on my feel, that uh, a number of our projects have been um, delayed and from both sides of the equation as far as we want change orders, others may want something else. We get caught in not just EDC world but the OMB world as well. And so I don't have a specific comment to the percentages because I haven't really, I, to my knowledge, heard that number before. And so I can't comment what's not. I can tell you, though, that, as you may know from prior testimony, that we put in place a tracking system that's open to the public and to our elected officials and others to take a look at, and we try to update that on a quarterly basis. And with that update, it provides where the delays are. But I, I can't respond to the specific numbers itself because I haven't seen those before. It seems uh, awfully high to me. Yeah, the only hesitation I would give, again, is without the facts in front of me, is that obviously we're aware of all the big projects, but there are a lot of little projects that are going on that are done very quietly, and they're very efficiently, and completed uh, when it comes to roof work and other types of things. So again, I would have to peel away the numbers to see exactly where that's at, but I just don't know. Would that I could say the same. Um, you know, if you look at it on a base on a on a fiscal year basis, and it's a little unfair to take the current fiscal year um, as an example, but those are the numbers that I have in front of me because you know we could make big strides in the next six months, and we're and we're hoping to do that, and we're planning to do that. But if you look at where we are right now in fiscal year 2018, um, our commitment rate is less than three percent. So it's you know. Even if we triple it um, in the next six months, it's it's not approaching 68 um, percent. Frankly, I can't explain the numbers. I don't really understand them, and it's not my experience right now on the projects in our portfolio. Um, since I've been at the library, which has not been a tremendously long time, it's been about two and a half years, um, we have not had. 50 some odd percent or 70 percent of our projects hit the milestones that they should be hitting in order to keep them on time and on budget. So now how we define on time is, is also uh -huh. uh, critically important, but, and Dennis, I, I heard what you're saying about smaller projects, but in my time, which is now approaching 20 years uh, being affiliated with this committee, um, there are a lot of small projects that go kaplooey uh -huh. as well, uh, to use a technical term. Um, and, and so it seems to me like we sometimes have just as much trouble getting an HVAC uh, system uh, installed on time or getting a roof done or getting the windows and doors finished uh -huh. as we do building a brand new library. I don't disagree with you at all. I just don't have a sense of where the numbers are. So I was just looking for something to try to give some type of justification. But beyond that, I don't know. Because we also have, as you well know, the challenges with HVA systems and HVAC systems as well as roof work as well. So I, I just don't know. I mean, and this is certainly not um, DDC's fault, but one of the problems at doing these projects piecemeal is that, you know, for example, at Walt Whitman where we you know, did one major repair to the roof, but then not the eaves, and so we ended up with a building that still wasn't watertight, even though a good portion of the project uh -huh. had, been com had been completed. And this has to do with funding streams. I will say that we have several boilers in our portfolio that have taken more than two or three or four years. And these are things that 
in the private world, they would be six months. But so, so obviously, to the average layperson hearing you say that, they would just go nuts, right? I mean, how is it that we can't get a boiler done, and you know, uh, the the kids are going to be cold in the winter, and and that's just nuts. So, so maybe explain why, in your estimation, that could even be possible in the city of New York, where we've got a capital commitment to the NYPL uh, in, in the hundreds of millions of dollars um, that we could get into a position that a boiler takes three years? Um, I, I think that it's a process-driven question, uh, answer. Um, there is a problem with the process. Um, we, and I think we spoke a little bit about design build. Well, boiler is a perfect example of something that should be design build. It should not have to go through a design procurement to get an engineer on board to provide a design that then has to get reviewed, mm -hmm. and then we have to go out to procurement to procure a boiler. This is something that in the private world, you'd find a contractor who is capable of doing a de design and install. And these are the smaller projects that suffer the most. So, and this dovetails a little bit into Hunter's point, but it applies to all of you. Because when you have a bad contractor, when something has gone horribly awry, describe your system's involvement with that, right? DDC has already said, so we award, we monitor, and then in the case of uh, these libraries, in particular, Hunters Point and Kew Gardens Hills, we have something that isn't working, that we could easily default, but we don't, because that would in some ways make it worse. Mm -hmm. Where are you in that, right? Where is the, the, the client agency saying to DDC, this thing has gone horribly wrong, right? We need a change. Do you ask for a change? Do you not ask for a change? Is DDC listening? Where is the systems when it comes to something, when it's starting to go horribly wrong, the train is off the track, and, and you all are, are saying to everyone, how do we get this thing back on track? Um, I'll use a project that we, a current project where we're experiencing this very problem. It's Belmont Roof, and I will say DDC was our partner. Um, they acknowledged that the contractor would not be able and capable of getting the job done, so they included us along the way. Would we have all been happier, and this is something I believe Tom spoke about earlier, if the requirements for the contractors were more stringent? if we got contractors who were low bidders who can perform. So um, I will say that we're included in the process. DDC has been transparent when they feel there is a contractor who is not capable. Uh, I have examples as well, and um, I think the process has improved in the last five years. And this is a project that was completed several years ago, but being told after the contractor has already been selected, that in fact the contractor can't do the work because either of it, because of his status or capability, and that you then have to go back and, and rebid it and find another contractor. There, there, there's a really broken process because you just keep losing time and you keep running into escalations on a project in that case, um, which was already underway. So I'm sorry. Uh, there's one thing about sharing information. There's another thing about about execution. So with Q Gardens Hills, I mean, that's our most recent example, Hunter's Point aside, um, we were a true partner in that process and discussion and a lot of blood, sweat and tears went over trying to resolve the outstanding issues and the debate that took place around whether to default, not to default, and what it would mean to default a contractor and how that would further delay 
And I think there was a collaboration between our team and the DDC team to put basically an oversight there, uh, Kew Gardens Hills, and having a result, as a result of having someone who was that oversight manager, it started push, pushing the project forward again where we resolve a lot of the outstanding issues. But even with that, there was still questions as far as whether the project would be completed or not and completed in what was then the new timeline. But again, I think through the collaboration between DDC and Queens Library, we were able to get to the end goal of completing that project and for the most part to most of our satisfaction. I mean, there's still outstanding issues, but we were able to open the library, the library is serving the customers, the community is fairly happy, and we're happy. So that was a true collaboration. Well, between uh, us. If I may, Please. Dennis, happy now that the library is open, but the time lost, oh, it's a difference. Uh, you'll never get back, uh -huh. right? And that Kew Gardens Hills Library was supposed to open years ago. And, and, um, and so I don't want uh, the feeling of utter joy when a project is completed and the library is open uh, uh, to get us to a place where we don't take stock of all of those years lost and and um, you know and that's that's a tragedy you know and, and both Kew Gardens Hills Hunters Point all these library mm -hmm. projects and and I just want to add so there's collaboration and there's there's uh, you mentioned partnering and and they're, they're sharing information in terms of a potential default or a contractor that can't complete the work collaboration is one thing but then actually making the decision to default or change course is that something that you all have the power to do or not? No, we do not have the power to do that, but we can be influencers in the process. And if I may just pick up on one point that you mentioned before, while I totally agree with you, the years lost and the years of service lost to the community needs to be in the forefront. If a wrong decision had been reached at this particular point in time, future years could have been lost as well. And we have to be conscious of that as far as the role of collaboration and making sure we don't address future loss of years and making decisions that may be heavy handed for one reason or another. And I think that's an important part because we definitely are on the ground as far as what's happening in that community. And I think, again, moving forward, we have to be, we have to be the ones, a heavy influencer, and that's why we're do doing internal assessment as far as how we are more upfront with the information going in, so that way we're not in a reactionary stage. And so I totally agree with you, sir, that the years lost, make sh we need to make sure that's always out there, but at the same time, in critical decision points, making sure we prevent years lost in the future, and how do we avoid that? Sure. It's frightening, though, to, to think about say Hunter's Point uh -huh. in terms of how many more years could be lost, right? Uh, I hear what you're saying, it's a valid point, but, but it, it has already been so painful. Uh -huh. It has already been delayed so many years, right? There are literally, and I don't just say this for dramatic, literally people who were involved in this project who have, who have died, right? Who will never get to see that library open, right? And, and that is part of my frustration with respect to that library, but really all libraries. And, and so I get that it could be worse. It could always be worse, I suppose. But the, the, the point is, what, what power do you have um, uh, to, to get in there to see it? And look, I, I, I believe the answer is, is DDC has most of that power, right? Let's be clear. They have most of that power. You have an advisory you can push, you can recommend. But we've got to get to a better place than this horrific decision where we're finding ourselves in, where defaulting a contractor is worse than staying with someone who is incompetent and unable to do the job right. And that's where we find ourselves too many times. And how are we finding ourselves in that position where someone we know who, who is horrible, know they're not doing the job right, keeping them on the job is actually the better decision. I will say that. If for someone who's brand new, you just jump in on all these tough <laughs> well, questions. I noticed we looked to her as well, so. <laughs> I gotta say. Sorry. Doing the work. Yeah. You know, part of the problem with this horrific, oh, 
I'm on. No, you're right? on. You're on. And I'm really loud, too. So, um, But part of the problem with the horrific decision is it takes so long to then start over mm -hmm. that I think we all experience a little, like, pause because, well, is it worth starting over? And that and was then, part of the fear of Kew Gardens Hills. Exactly. I mean, the stopping and then having to go through the process again to start up again. And so Kew Gardens Hill, if we had to do that, wouldn't be open right now. And I mean, that's a guarantee. It would not be open right now. And then the surety bonds and everything else. I mean, so again, that, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's no, a that's real example where we had to make that decision with Kew Gardens Hill. And, and I think that that's really what sort of weighs on all of us with these projects. Um, if it was your own home and there was a contractor who wasn't performing, he'd be gone in a day and you'd find someone else. Um, I think with these projects, we have so much time invested in them that it makes the decision so much more difficult. So I asked DDC before about how they prioritize library projects and the staffing at the library unit. Do all three of you believe that the Department of Design and Construction gives the appropriate level of priority to library projects and are they appropriately staffed in your opinion? The library unit in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't really feel like I'm in a place where I can, um, you know, sort of run someone else's business, but if you just look at the statistics, the fact that, and I can say this because of the three library systems, the throughput for Brooklyn is always at the bottom of the heap, um, not significantly, but the fact that we are relative to other agencies getting the level of service that we are that's even by their own um, statistics so much lower than the others would, you know, lead you to only one conclusion, which is that there's a problem, and if it's staffing or whatever it is, but it needs to be addressed. Yeah, I, I would just respond somewhat similar to Linda in that reality for their portfolio, I mean, libraries are a small part of their portfolio, and so with it being a small part of their portfolio, obviously the resources are devoted elsewhere, but then I would also put a comma there for a second or a semicolon, because at the same time, I think that we have gotten more attention over the last number of months, and in fairness to DDC, I think they put in certain new protocols in place for communication with both the library unit as well as other types of ways of working with us as libraries, and so the feeling loved has increased more and more uh, as a result of, I think, the changes that the uh, commissioner and her team have made, and again, always try to be fair and balanced. I mean, when we call around an issue, they respond right away now. I mean, it's not an issue. There isn't a delay. And again, with our protocol systems that we put in place, at least at Queens, I feel the attention is there. But again, we have to deal with it on the grand scheme of things as far as libraries are just a small portion of DDC's responsibility. They're definitely a small portion of the responsibility, but even that small portion of the responsibility, I believe, should get the same level mm -hmm of professionalism and attention uh, as their largest portion of their portfolio. I always feel, though, that they are professional. I mean, that's the one thing. I mean, I've never felt that they have not been professional to us, and I have not felt that they have not responded when we have called around an issue, but at the same time, I think with the allocation of resources available to them, um, their allocation of resources is other places as they have other major responsibilities. I would just um, echo that point and say that our colleagues at DDC are professional. They certainly are knowledgeable. Um, I, I think there is an issue with potentially staffing, but also allocation of staffing. And where is the staff needed? I know that we've experienced delays in the review process, whether it be engineering reviews or constructability reviews. And I don't know if that's where there needs to be more staff so the reviews can get done more expeditiously, but something's not quite working. And I don't know that it's just the number of staff or where they are in the organization. Right. I appreciate that, and let me be clear, I'm not uh, attacking uh, the professionalism, but really the prioritization and the staff allocation that you just spoke to, that's, um, that's clearly the issue here. Um, 
So I wanted to ask you uh, all, but really with some focus on Dennis and Hunter's point, because I asked the, the acting commissioner this, what lessons were learned at Hunter's point uh, that have caused that agency to change the way they do business? And so the question is specific to Dennis in terms mm -hmm. of what the Queen's Library could have and should have done differently, your lessons learned, uh, but then also to the other two systems, do we think the lessons learned that they talked about are the right, run, right ones or enough, and what other lessons learned could there or should there be to make sure that there are not other library projects languishing for years like all three of you experienced, but obviously then is specific to Hunter's point, but the other two systems specific to the lessons learned that you heard from DDC today, is it enough, should we go further? So I'll, I'll be glad to take the first stab at this. So lessons learned. One, that we're going to be more active in the engagement or process early on, and both the design part of the process as well as the monitoring of what's going on there. Uh, it's my sense, and you would know this as well and probably way better than I do, that Hunter's Point, extremely important project, but at the same time, somewhere along the line it got off the track as far as the design is concerned and the monitoring and what was going on there and we the library need to play an active role in the beginning stages of the process and not saying it's DDC but a variety of different circumstances that contributed for it to be where it's at right now. We're not going to allow that to happen in the future as the library system. We're putting that in place already with Far Rockaway. Uh, so with Far Rockaway we've raised a number of questions. We've talked to DDC about it and we're responsible as far as anything that pops up uh, that is of concern. And as we move forward, uh, making sure both from a community input process as well as an internal process, we're active players in the beginning and not allowing it to be dictated to us as far as what something will look like. We're never going to allow that to happen again uh, as long as I'm CEO. And so that's something that to me is extremely important that I've learned. Uh, from Hunter's Point, as well as Kew Gardens Hill to some extent and some of the other projects. Uh, another point that's been learned as well as far as ongoing dialogue with all of our stakeholders in a very open way so people know exactly what's going on. I don't like secrets. I don't like to not have transparency to all of our stakeholders. So therefore we put the tracking system in place and making sure our tracking system online has all accurate information with timelines. And that gives people a better sense of what's going on, who the funding sources are, uh, and where we are in the project. And then again with Hunter's Point in particular, it's just one, as you well know, it's just one thing after another. And while the commissioner has talked about it, we should never ever be in a position of being dependent again for uh, glass to come from another country that has to be shipped over from a different country to go to a different state to be cured then to be transported down to New York. I mean, there's just flaws in that and we've experienced it and uh, through no fault of DDC, uh, as a result of that process, then we were subject to a, sh a dock strike. And the dock strike, for we shouldn't be in that position. We shouldn't be in that position at all. But can I just interject? Please. Because you just said through no fault of DDC, but surely the dock strike. Oh, okay. Dock strike. Right, right. They didn't create the dock strike uh, in Spain, I believe. But we were dependent on the dock strike right. as a result of it being over there right. itself. And so, again, I think through the input of uh, everything that we've learned through Hunter's Point and some of the issues that we've faced with Kew Gardens Hills, right. our goal through John and his team in working with Lou will make sure we have a front end process in place that will never allow that to happen again. And that's some of the lessons that we've learned as far as both the design part of it and then taking a look at a vertical design again, you know, as I've taken a look at some of the old information. A vertical design is very difficult and understands space limitations, but a vertical design puts in a number of challenges, which I imagine we'll talk about in a little while as well. And a vertical design opens us up for all types of issues that we have to respond to. And how do we flatten that out? Final thing that I've learned, and probably more than final others as well, in that I don't think with Hunter's Point in particular, uh, and as we move to double the size of our Lindsay boxes and moving to basically an average size of 18,000 square feet compared to 7,500 square feet or how they were built before, uh, people took a look at the staffing implications and what that means from a design aspect as well. 
in that you have blind spots, you have a number of issues that are put up there that a Lindsay box will not allow uh, those types of design flaws to be in existence. And I think we have a responsibility to do further research and take a look at what that means as far as future designs moving forward. So those are just off the top of my head, sir, some of the lessons learned from Hunter's Point and what it means for the future designs of libraries, at least in our portfolio. So let me, let me just say a couple of things. Please. The windows, uh, this committee uh, asked a previous uh, DDC uh, commissioner where the windows were at. That answer is now legend in the city council, right, where we had a GPS tracking device on a ship in the middle of the ocean. And other members now recite that answer uh, when we talk about DDC, right? We should never, ever be in a position again where we, we are tracking uh, a ship uh, with uh, a, an app, a geolocating app device um, that in some cases wasn't even accurate, right? We, we had no clue where the glass was sometimes and, and it was horrifically uh, uh, bungled every step of the way. And, and uh, if one thing came out of this hearing and experience that we're never gonna do that again, that's a very good thing, but um, as you know, Dennis, we're talking about $40 million in, mm -hmm. in uh, public uh, dollars uh, in this particular case. That's an extraordinary investment of taxpayer dollars. And, and we've got to do a better job of making sure that in our desire to build special buildings, which is uh, a good and important element of what we do, uh, we are not doing things like ordering glass, that's made in Germany, glazed in Spain, shipped to Connecticut, and then finally brought home to Long Island City uh, in a way that most average people would be mortified and angry of learning about that journey and about that choice. And also, when you talk about lessons learned, I think one more thing for me is the operational implementation of the impact of a design as well. And that's really an important lesson learned. So using the glass as an example, what if something happens to that? What does that actually mean? Now, we've talked already to DDC about that, and so uh, we have a plan moving forward, but what does that mean? Or you're gonna have gravel around a certain area, but at the same time, does that gravel really serve a functional purpose, or is it just aesthetically pleasing? And what's the operational implementation and managing of that particular aspect of a design as well? Or you have a design in a library, which is not Hunter's Point, uh, that may look pleasing, but in reality serves no functional purpose, and if something should break, then we bear the cost on the expense side of replenishing it because it's no longer capitally eligible. What does that mean for the library moving forward? Because then you're taking away expense dollars that can be used elsewhere as well. So what's the functionality of a design in as far as the operationalizing of it in the future where we have to bear it from an expense side while it may look good, but the reality is we have to maintain the looking good, which then takes away from Right, the and these were horrific decisions that were made, and I realized before you were in, in your position. Uh, one final question, though, about Hunter's point before we get to the other two systems. DDC testified that the building would be ready in August of 2018 mm -hmm. and handed over to you. Yep. Um, uh, I respect the acting commission a great deal. However, we have heard a lot of dates over uh, the last several years. Uh, do you believe that that's real? Do you believe you'll get the building in August of 2018? And if you get the building in August of 2018, how long is it going to take the Queen's Library to open that building to the public? I have great trust in this commissioner, so I believe it, and that uh, she and her team have worked very hard and closely with us as far as talking about the next steps with Hunter's Point and where things are at, and so we're prepared based on what she said uh, to then go in, and for Hunter's Point, it will take us up to six months to outfit it. It's a uniquely, as you well know, a unique design. It's not your true uh, library when it comes to the outfitting. When we talk about outfitting a normal library, it can be roughly three, four months. With Hunter's Point, we're saying six months to outfit it because 
we have to do a lot of the integration work, and it's just a lot of complexity connected with the vertical building uh, that's in place. So we're saying six months once we get it turned over to us is substantially completed. And are you, are you um, being cautious in your estimate? Six months, I realize that the building is unique, but then you're talking about February of 2019, that library opening. That is correct. I'm giving you a timeline that is realistic for us. We've had a number of internal meetings with our team. And so whenever it's turned over to us, we will turn it back over uh, as an opening library or a library that's ready to open in a six-month period of time just based on our normal process of not just the ordering because we could start that, but it's a lot of the gut work of connecting a building to become a library. And that's behind the scenes. I mean, one of the things I wanted to do with Kew Gardens, but it was a little late before I was able to put that idea in place, and this is something that I want to do, is really get the public a sense of what goes into opening up a brand new library, because I think people don't have a clear sense of what's involved in that. So once we get it, six months, we'll have it open uh, for the public. I'm sure you uh, would realize that anyone uh, living in the vicinity of the Harness Point Library hearing that would be in some cases outraged and, and really true. angry as I am that, uh -huh. that we're looking at those kind of dates uh, on a project that should have been open to the public already. And, um, you know, it is, it is an utter disgrace uh, that this has happened uh, to the people of Long Island City. And while the day that it opens will be a glorious day, uh, it will always be an outrage that that library uh, was mangled as it was, given uh, its importance to the community. And uh, I can only urge you and your team, as we will DDC, to, uh, to try and shrink those timelines and get that building open even sooner. Uh, the people of, of, of uh, New York City deserve better uh, when it comes to these capital projects. And... Um, uh, it is impossible to go back into the past now and revisit every decision that was made, but uh, we've got to make sure that this doesn't happen again. We truly um, respect that, sir. Do the other two library systems have more on the non Hunters Point related parts of those questions? Unless you'd like to offer commentary on the Hunters Point Library. Um, yeah. Since Reese has done such a great job, she can take over and uh, testify for me next time as well. If you've got better answers on the Hunters Point Library, Tony Marks is in trouble. Thank you very much. I guess that's a no. For <laughs> <Ms>. um, <laughs> um, uh, Pass-throughs. So, look, there, there is, there is uh, as we all know, a fundamental uh, difference in, in some ways from the, the, the monies available to near public library than the other two systems, right? So there's, there's an ability maybe to do more of these projects potentially uh, because of the, the, the need to, to front load cash, which the other two systems are a little bit uh, more challenged by. But do you wanna do more? If you wanna do more, particularly for Brooklyn and Queens, can you even do more and do you think DDC should be, uh, in some ways, letting these projects go through, pass through much more frequently? So I'll, I'll start, uh, because if I had answered the question about lessons learned, um, the first lesson learned would have been um, that you know we're trying to take control of more of our own projects um, and not so much I mean we really don't even want to be doing the roofs and the boilers and the HVAC systems and if they could be design build that would be terrific um, but the projects that are you know complete gut renovations or or new buildings you know we are making a strong play with DDC to be um, doing them as pass-throughs um, and that's one of the reasons that the Brooklyn Heights project was so important, so that we would have cash that we could use to, f to front end. But um, DDC, frankly, has been cooperating with us. I mean, um, and we've, we've gotten some of the permissions uh, that we need in order to be doing our own project. And they need to approve pass-throughs, correct? Or the city? Yeah. We're the same. I mean, we're not at the level that Brooklyn may be right now with the Brooklyn Heights, but 
we are definitely interested in more pass-throughs, and part of my goal and our goal is to raise money privately to allow us to do that. And so we have a new team in place on our foundation side, and part of the charge of the foundation is not to just think along the lines of expense or programmatic dollars, but also capital dollars as well. And so I have a couple of uh, places where I'm looking to go that are not necessarily in Brooklyn uh, to raise money and to see how we can enhance our capital portfolio to allow us to do more pass-throughs both on the broader scale as well as some of the smaller scale and we're always in communication with DDC around that process. I, I mean I hate to open a can of worms but one thing we haven't talked about is costs. Um, we've been talking about time and um, we know that if we handle things ourselves that we can not only do it on time, but that we can also reduce the budget significantly. Uh -huh. uh, well, we are doing several pass-throughs right now, and while they are extremely successful and DDC has been very supportive in um, making sure that we can get through the process, it's not a sustainable way for NYPL, or I wonder if any of us, to do projects. We just really need to find a better process. Um, it's not the answer. It's tempting because it it's so successful so, and, it's, so and, frustrating and it's fast and it's so frustrating otherwise. But I believe that in order for us to be truly successful as a tri li team, um, we need to find better ways to get projects done, and that is not only the large projects, but the boilers mm -hmm. and the agencies. Boilers right. especially. Especially, yeah. especially the smaller projects right. that are not, you know, architecturally or aesthetically driven, like just right. get those knocked it's out. It's knee driven. Yeah. And, and uh, obviously you can't do anything without library staff. You can't be a library without people who work in the library, but they are impacted a great deal by these delays as well, um, working in limbo, working in uh, conditions that uh, uh, are very difficult and challenging. So I just want to recognize uh -huh. uh, the staff of the library systems as well. Um, so listen, as you probably gather, I could talk about this for hours. Um, but uh, I think we will um, uh, let you go at this point. We have another panel. Uh, but uh, I want to thank you for uh, being here and uh, sharing uh, some of your thoughts and lessons learned, and hopefully uh, we will have fewer situations like this going forward. Um, thank you again. And thank you for the opportunity, sir. We really appreciate it, and happy yes. holiday thank to you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. We'll let Iris know how wonderful you did. Um, And our last panel is Michael White, uh, Jean Ruskin, I think, and Catherine O'Sullivan. I hope I'm right there as well. Thank you. 
Library systems are so disruptive and so loud and talking so much. <laughs> um, all right, I think we're going to go on a three minute clock uh, for all of you, we are very late. Um, but I want to thank you for staying and um, whoever wants to go first on the panel amongst yourselves. Should go left to right? Yes, why don't you with the, just put your microphone on there. Okay, yeah, I'm going to go first because I have a four o'clock appointment. Okay. But I do want to testify. So my name is Catherine O'Sullivan and I'm a member of Save Inwood Library and also Inwood Preservation. And I'm here to testify on the New York Public Library's plans um, perhaps their latest master plan for the, uh, for the Central Research Library should be called the Central Library Plan 2. Because how can this plan move forward when a shroud of secrecy surrounds the stacks? The stacks are fundamental to the Central Research Library. And any refurbishment being considered must disclose to the public what is planned for them. I've asked, I've been at their presentations, and we're told, well, several scenarios are being studied. But when asked what sort of scenarios, you get no answer. So that's on the central uh, research library plan. Uh, I feel if certain individuals among the trustees no longer hold the best interests of the New York Public Library as central to their function as trustee, perhaps it's time for them to step down. Real estate development and housing should not be concerns of a public library trustee. Now I get to the, the, the library dearest to my heart, and I've heard you speak about the Hunter's Point Library, so I know it's uh, dear to your heart. But the demolition plan for the Inwood branch of the New York Public Library is an example of trustees abandoning their role as protectors of our public library. In 1998, a 4.3 million renovation and expansion of our branch was undertaken. Tony Marks was blown away by the wonderful renovation. The much-loved library won a, a community award in 2016, and over 5,000 Inwood Library users object to this plan to sell the library to a developer for a dollar, demolish it, and replace it with an inferior space. Smaller, no room for expansion, and would require an upzoning because their uh, request for a proposal said that the, the, the developer, the prospective developer, should assume an R8 zoning. Well, most of Inwood wants an R7 cap on zoning, so I don't know where the democratic process is in this. Um, let me see. I, I asked um, a member of the public library why Inwood Library was being targeted, and I was told because of the air rights. So, okay, air rights, sell the air rights. No problem there, but this is a perfectly good library. Fix the boiler, fix the leaks in the roof. It's fine. Inwood people love it. We don't want to lose it. And going on the timing, that it, the delays, there's no way we're going to be without a library for eight or ten years. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pick up on, how do I, do I hit the button? Yes. Okay. I guess I'm on now. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, my, my name is Jeannie Ruskin. I've been an Inwood resident for 36 plus years, so this is dear to my heart as well. Um, I'm speaking in opposition to the proposed plan for the demolition and reconstruction of the Inwood Library. In 2016, Inwood Library was the only Manhattan Library branch that won the NYC Neighborhood Library Award for libraries going above and beyond to provide exceptional services and programming for their communities. It's open seven days a week. That's rare. Inwood's award-winning library serves people of all ages with programming that includes tutoring, homework help, English classes, story time, Spanish language computer and internet classes, workshops on immigration rights, free film screenings, and more. Scores of Inwood students count on Inwood's library to do their homework. They don't have computers or internet at home, and they're required to do their homework on a computer. Now, we've been told, and this has been documented, Inwood Library would be sold to a developer for $1. This is part of the public-private 
deals that are being worked here. Inwood Library would be torn down with no guarantee of any interim library or even library services during the demolition or reconstruction. This means no guaranteed library for five or more years. You know what I'm talking about. I've just heard lots of your reasons and experience there. Now that's a lifetime in a student's history. Five years is a student's lifetime. Why would it take five or more years? Because there's documented toxic brownfield contamination next door, which has probably migrated to the library site. That takes time to test and to clean up. The latest standard new building in Inwood is the TD Bank building. It took three and a half years to build that, and it's only two stories high. They want to build something 14 stories high on the library site that would be luxury housing after they tear down the library. The proposed new library would be permanently capped at a size that's 20% smaller than its current size. And now how does that serve the future of a growing community estimated to become possibly 14,000 more people if the expansion due to the rezoning goes through? There's no guarantee that any Inwood residents could get an apartment in this proposed building. This affordability is based on some AMI that is an average of Westchester County as well as other parts of the city, and it does have no has no bearing on Inwood residents' actual incomes. And in, in addition to which, it would be offered at a lottery on a lottery basis. So, this is a displacement issue that also needs to be addressed. Now, the city owns dozens of empty and underused properties in northern Manhattan. They don't have to tear down our library to build housing. Thank you. Uh, Save Inwood Library campaign is a local campaign of Inwood neighbors. We've been very active. Thank you for the time. Michael White, Citizens Defending Libraries. Um, I'm glad to hear the testimony on the Inwood Library and endorse the uh, complaints and objections to the Inwood Library being turned into a real estate deal. At this hearing, I've heard a lot of uh, uh, grinding down on Department of Design and Construction and uh, the offering of ideas why it would be good to uh, turn a lot of construction over to uh, the libraries privately. But I'd like to remind everybody that um, one of those private deals was the Central Library Plan, which started out at uh, $300 million price tag. Um, it ultimately went to over $500 million, over half a billion dollars. How much over that? We don't know because those figures were not released. Now, that was one of the things that was turned over to the, uh, the library. And, in fact, uh, when the per we heard per square footage figures here, uh, in 2013, this committee heard per square footage about that when it was still a lower price, and then it was uh, multiples of what the DDC figures were for per square footage, which brings me to what I am prepared to testify, and uh, the testimony is up on the web, and that's where the Central Library Plan is today. Um, the 42nd Street Research Library was designed around the central refer reference library, uh, around the stacks, as a book delivery system. First and foremost, very exquisitely designed around those stacks. The NYPL is now uh, releasing plans that inverts that process, where they're design designing the entire library, and then one day they're going to think about what they do with the stacks as an afterthought. Now, that includes very expensively putting in uh, a new elevator system and a new staircase in a building that has very ample and, uh, circulation that has worked for over a hundred years. Um, how much will that cost? Well, we're talking millions. We're talking really big dollars compared to anything that's been talked about uh, at this hearing today. How much will that cost? The architects said that they don't know dollar-wise or percentage-wise how big a part of that plan is. Um, there's an overall commercialization aspect to what they're doing, uh, taking, for instance, the map room and map room reading space and turning it into a cafe, nice pictures where you uh, have wait staff and people looking at uh, racks of wines on the wall and what they might choose to have. Um, 
Do the trustees, they're out of control. Do the trustees question that? No, their only question about uh, turning it, putting in a cafe was whether it should be opened up to take over part of the public space of Bryant Park. Um, there's more complete testimony before you. It's up on the web. Um, you're talking about getting control of DDC. I think you need to get control over the construction process that the NYPL trustees are doing and as, as a private sector project, uh, excluding DDC. Uh, I appreciate both of you uh, staying uh, so long and, and uh, caring enough about libraries to testify here today. Appreciate your input. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. And with that, we are adjourned.